er denne på? Denne er på. Så hyggelig. Da må alle sette seg ned. Vi kan ønske velkommen til dem hjemme også, eller dem som sitter andre steder, for vi er også via streaming. Det er fint. Mitt navn er Thorin Gemdal. Jeg er da administrerende her på huset. Jeg skal si noe nord innledningsvis. Ikke om programmet, for det skal Margit få lov til å si noen ting om etterpå, om selve programmet, sånn at vi har en introduksjon til dette. Dere som da snakker et litt annet språk, dere er det også opplest på norsk. Ja, dere kan det. Fint. Alle nikker. Det er bra. Velkommen, som sagt. Jeg kan si bitt litt om hvordan vi jobber her på Doga, for vi jobber jo ganske mye internasjonalt. Så jeg tenkte å si to ord om hvordan vi gjør det, og ikke hvorfor, for det håper jeg de aller fleste er kjent med. Vi må øke eksporten vår, øke eksporten for Norge, for at vi skal ha noe å leve av fremtidig. Jeg skal bare skifte en slide her, sånn at vi har også programmet i dag. Det skal Ingrid ikke ordne. Sånn ut det. Der. Og så kan vi skifte en ting til. Fordi vi jobber på denne måten. Vi har en verdikjede som vi jobber etter, og den er firedelt. Og så ser vi at de ulike markedene fungerer litt ulikt, og det går litt på modenhet i markedene. Så de fire trinnene vi har som vi jobber etter, og det ser vi på kryss og tvers egentlig i det som vi kaller virkemiddelapparatet, så jobber vi ganske likt i forhold til dette. Vi kaller det litt ulike ting, men i bunn og grunn er det ganske likt. Det vil si at vi har fire trinn som er kartlegging, synliggjøring, utveksling og eksport. Det vil si at sluttmålet vårt med det arbeidet vi gjør er selvfølgelig å øke eksporten. Men for å kunne gjøre dette så må vi ha kjennskap og kunnskap om de lokale markedene. Det kommer vi litt tilbake til i løpet av dagen også. Så da driver vi en kartlegging, men også en kunnskapsinnhenting av hva er mulighetene, hva er utfordringene i de lokale markedene, det vil si i andre land, sånn at vi blir da mer treffsikre når vi skal inn i de markedene kan vi faktisk tilby det som det lokale markedet etterspør. Så det er litt viktig å ikke bare prøve å pushe og selge, eller å tilby noe som det ikke er behov for. Og så er det litt ulik modenhetsgrad på de ulike markedene. Det vil si at det er noen marked, eksempelvis kan vi si at Kina er ikke så godt kjent med hva norsk arkitektur eller norsk design kan bidra med, eller hva det er for noen ting. Da er det viktig å synliggjøre dette for å bygge en interesse rundt det. Det vil si at vi da kan drive med informasjonsarbeid, eventuelt utstillinger eller annen type virksomhet. Nummer tre her er da selvfølgelig da en har en utveksling, det vil si mer en business to business, der vi kan bygge andre type samarbeid på kryss og tvers av de landene vi er på samarbeid med, men med formål om at vi også skal øke da eksporten. Her på Doga så ser vi for at vi håndterer et ganske bredt spekter. Det vil si design består jo også av mote, det består av tjeneste- og servicedesign, industridesign, produktdesign, etc. Så vi har mange ulike disipliner innenfor design. Det gjelder også for så vidt arkitektur, men arkitektur er i utgangspunktet å selge konsulenttimer eller tjenester. Og det ser vi en veldig stor forskjell på de ulike disiplinene. Mote, for eksempel, har økt eksporten sin med 11,4 prosent. Det er ganske mye. Ferdigvareindustrien, som design er en ganske stor del av, de øker også mye. Nå ser jeg på deg, Lars-Emil, for du har gitt oss tall fra Danmark i forhold til dansk arkitektur. Så danske arkitekter, deres omsetning, altså totalomsetning, knyttet til utenlandsmarkedet er på 28 prosent. I Norge så er dette tallet, hold dere fast, under 1 prosent. I utgangspunktet så sier vi at vi selger mye av det samme, altså norsk og dansk arkitektur, det er det nordiske, og tuftet på nordiske verdier, så vi mener jo selvfølgelig at potensialet er formidabelt, også for norsk arkitektur, å øke den eksporten. Så kan vi si at vi ser forskjell på norsk og dansk arkitektur, det gjør vi jo også på svensk, men 
i utgångspunkten, hvis du ser lite brett på det, så har vi mycket av det samma produkter som vi kan sälja. Så det är er möjligheten för att öka. Det är er många grunder att det kanske talan inte är högre, men det kan vi bara lite mer i idag och hur vi ska göra dem högre, alltså öka den exporten av norsk arkitektur. Så det var väldigt kort. Jeg kan tacka inledningsvis nu. vi samarbetar ju brett med väldigt många i förhåll till det programmet som vi då har ska grund att vi är er här för att se si sån arkitektur ut i världen så må vi då tacka sig för kulturdepartementet så där er vi någon representanter fra kulturdepartementet som har finansierat programmet. Eh då vill självklart tacka ett utmärkt samarbete med Innovation Norge. Så kommer också tillbaka till det. Och så är er det vår kallen generell samarbetspart som vi har är er ju då självklart eh, utrikesdepartementet som vi jobbar med daglig eh, sammen med för att då öka exporten över Vi, som dere hører, så samarbeider vi med veldig mange, så vi skal ikke ta alle nå. Men med det så tror jeg vi tar over på programmet. Velkommen til Margit Klingendams fra Innovasjon Norge, og vår egen Ingrid i Helsing Almås. Vær så god. Takk. Du sitter, ja. Jeg heter Margit. Jeg kommer fra Innovasjon Norge, og jeg har jobbet med det programmet arkitektur ut i världen eh, i en lång tid eh, nu och samarbetat med Doga. Eh, som en del av regeringens eh, satsing på kulturell och kreativ näring så fick Innovation Norge i 2017 ett uppdrag eh, om att genomföra ett exportprogram för arkitektur i samarbete med Doga. Idag så markerar vi avslutningen av detta programmet. Eh, og programmet har haft som mål att bidra med kompetens och kapital till de bedrifterna som har potential och som har ambitioner om att gå internationellt. Det har varit väldigt lärorikt för oss i Innovation Norge och samarbete med Doga, men också först och främst att bli känt med de arkitektbedrifterna som har varit en del av programmet. Og det att samarbeta tätt med Doga har varit en glädje. Och du sitter på mig Ingrid. Ja, ja tack. Så vad är er ett ut i världen program, ett exportprogram? Jag vill bara raskt ta det igenom det siden detta är er utgångspunkten för dagen. ett ut i världen program, alltså arkitektur ut i världen är er en del av flera eller det är er flera program som tillhör ut i världen programmen. det är er alltså tidsgränsade program som är er skräddarsydda per bransch. Eh, og, eh, det er, altså, arkitektur er jo en av elve bransjer innenfor kulturell og kreativ næring, det er derfor jeg nevner dette. Og oppdraget fra Kulturdepartementet gjelder da kulturell og kreativ næring og alle de elve bransjene, og derfor også arkitektur. Eh, og Kulturdepartementets oppdrag, eh, der spesifiseres det at disse programmene skal gjøres i samarbeid med bransjeorganisasjonen. Og det er, vel, det er helt avgjørende, for bransjeorganisasjonen, som Doga, har fagkunskapen om arkitektur i dette tilfellet. Mens Innovasjon Norge har da, kommer da med forretningskompetansen og mer, eh, og så kanskje også eh, eh, dette med markedskunnskapen, siden vi har et stort markedsapparat. Og målet er å svare på bransjens utfordringer og bidra til at de deltakende bedriftene får økt omsetning og konkurransekraft i utlandet. Vi i Innovasjon Norge vi måles på sysselsetting og omsetning, så det blir også bedriftene som er en del av dette programmet målt på. Men selvfølgelig også mer kvalitative mål, siden det er, øh, det er jo ikke lange program, det er en kort tid vi snakker om, et og et halvt år cirka. Og hvorfor gjør vi dette? Hvorfor gjør regjeringen dette? Hva, hva er målsetningen bak å etablere sånne type nye program? Jo, det er jo at eksportandelen eh, av den totale omsetningen for norske kulturelle og kreative bransjer er liten, eh, og eksportpotensialet er stort. Så her tenker regjeringen at her ved at man tilfører kompetanse og kapital i et tidsbegrenset program med rådgivning, så kan man bidra til at eksportandelen øker. Så fra 2016 til 2019 så har vi da altså haft tre eh, ut i verden program. Det ene, det første i samarbeid med Norsk Filminstitutt, eh, Spill ut i verden, hvor åtte bedrifter var med. Eh, det andre var da Arkitektur ut i verden, hvor syv bedrifter var med. Det er mange av dere som er til stede her i dag. 
eh, og det samarbeid med Doga, som vi har sagt noen ganger nå. Og det tredje eh, er et samarbeid med Norla, litteratur ute i verden, hvor også syv bedrifter deltar. Kan vi klikke på neste? Her ser dere det folkene bak de, de grunnlaget. Øverst, øverst her er spill ut i verden bedriftene, og ned til eh, venstre så har dere litteratur ut i verden, og så har vi arkitektur ut i verden til høyre. Det er ikke de beste bildene, men dette var liksom første dagen vi møtte staden, eh, så måtte vi ta et bilde. Neste. Så har vi eh, siden, det er jo Disse ut i verden-programmene er jo innovative i sig selv, så vi, det har jo tatt litt tid å komme på plass og kunne få beskrevet og forklart dette tydelig. Og mye kom på plass også når vi samarbeidet med Doga. Tor Inge, det var vel du og jeg som satt, ikke gå, <laughs> som satt på første workshopen vår og, og snakket om hvordan kan man beskrive disse ut i verden-programmene på en tydelig måte. Eh, og da kommer vi frem til det er tre nivå grunnleggende. Bedrift, gruppe og bransje. Eh, og i utgangspunktet så er det en utlysning, altså en åpen utlysning, så hele eh, bransjen kan søke med visse kriterier. Eh, og et ekspertpanel eh, bidrar da til å velge ut. Og ekspertene er da både internasjonale og nasjonale. Og nå har vi Jack Renteria til stedet her. Eh, han var en del av ekspertpanelet for eh, arkitektur eh, ute i verden. Var det den andre? Nei. Eh, og eh, da får man da, hvis man når opp, så får man muligheten til å få eksportmidler, altså tilskudd, basert på den søknaden man har levert. Nivå 2 er da gruppe, og de utvalgte bedriftene får da eh, delta i et skreddersydd program, kompetanseprogram, eh, hvor de selv har muligheten til å bidra med eh, innspill til behov, behov til kompetansetilførsel, og også eventuelle marked som det er interessant å, å, å lære mer av. Og så det tredje nivået er da eh, bransjenivået. Da settes det i gang felles bransjetiltak og settes av egne midler, som jeg sa, og frokostmøte kan være et eksempel. Vi har hatt to frokostmøter, ikke sant, for arkitektur ute i verden. Konferanser, sånn som dette, er bransjetiltak, og også deltakelse på internasjonal, internasjonale arenaer, eller lignende. Det gjaldt blant annet spill ute i verden. Ja. Og alle programmene vil jo selvfølgelig bli eh, evaluert, eh, både kvantitativt og kvalitativt. Så det kommer i høsten 2019. Og jeg vet at eh, de syv bedriftene som har deltatt i programmet har jobbet hardt. Det har vi sett eh, med både deltakelse og aktiviteter. Og vi er også intervjurunder, så vi har eh, fått mye input på hva konkrete eh, resultater har vært i løpet av disse eh, to årene. Eh, og jeg vet at flere melder fra om at jeg har kommet et steg videre, eh, og at det nå jobbes mer strategisk med eh, å få internasjonale oppdrag. Og det er veldig, veldig gledelig å, å se. Eh, og denne konferansen er jo siste post på programmet. Eh, det er trist, jeg synes egentlig det er, er synd, rett og slett. Det har blitt skikkelig, en skikkelig bra gjeng. Eh, Eh, så, så, og selv om vi har kommet et steg videre, så er vi absolutt ikke i mål, eh, noen av oss, hverken virkemiddelapparatet eller, eh, eller bedriftene. Eh, så jeg gleder meg eh, til å se, eh, eller følge med på videreutviklingen i bransjen, og jeg gleder meg til denne dagen, hvor internasjonalisering er i fokus. Jeg gleder meg veldig til å lære mer. And sorry, Carmela, I should be in English. <laughs> så, eh, så, takk, tusen takk. Da, Ingrid. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, we said this day would be a uh, kind of mix of uh, English and uh, Norwegian, so I'm going to kick off in English, and uh, we'll mix along the way as, um, as is practical. Um, uh, just very quickly, uh, what this program has uh, consisted of, uh, the initial um, uh, bevilgning from Kulturdepartementet <laughs> was 10 million kroner. Uh, of which most has uh, been given directly to the participating uh, businesses. It's been a collaboration between Innovation Norge and uh, Innovation Norway and DOGA. Uh, uh, it consists, the program consists of both capital support and a competency program, which is, uh, uh, which is essential um, in these uh, programs. 
Uh, it's also been, uh, we've also had uh, initiatives for the entire profession, and um, also, which should be mentioned, it was an open um, call for participants, so it was open for everybody. The fact that there were only 13, uh, 13 apl applicants, I think, says something about that 1% that Toringe was uh, mentioning initially. Um, you know, there is... Uh, there, is, there are some things in the uh, Norwegian architectural market to be analysed, and I hope we will st start to scratch that surface um, during the day. These are the seven uh, participating uh, practices. Our lab, Biotop, Haugen Sohar, Architects, Helen Hard, Lund Hagem, Architects, Raul Framsta, Architects, and Rodeo, Architects, all um, fairly established, some very established practices, uh, with already international portfolios. The um, application asked for, um, or the open call asked for, the, for people to apply with already, as it were, a fish on the hook. Uh, so that the, uh, the, that the offices uh, should be ready, willing and able, as you say in uh, Innovation Norway, to go international. Th there had to be already a door that was at least ajar, if not wide open. Um, um, and so people had uh, projects in a lot of different markets in the Nordic countries, in the north of Europe, and either and further afield, like Japan and India. Um, so obviously we were not focusing on a specific market um, entry strategy related to just one market. We had to look at uh, the focus was on developing the businesses. And also a lot of people have changed horses during the course of this uh, year and a half and gone from one project to another or from one market to another as opportunities kind of opened and closed. So that flexibility has been uh, an important part of the program as well. Um, the main aim of um, Architecture Go Global has been to learn. So not to build business, not to earn money, but to learn. And that's very important also, I think, to realize um, uh, today. Uh, obviously, architecture takes a long time. And no one expected that during the course of this program, you would see a massive increase in turnover of the participating companies. It takes a long time to build buildings. It takes a long, long time to establish an architecture, pro, um, um, architecture project, and particularly in a foreign market. So the intention was to learn, and that's also what we will uh, report on in the final, um, in the final instance. Um, but it still seems that there's a paradox um, in our uh, profession that the our references, our history, and also the education is so international. And then yet when it comes to uh, the business side of the profession, uh, we are actually very insular. So the, that's uh, something that we have tried to address in the, all the meetings and uh, the gatherings that we've had um, in the program. And uh, during the course of today, the, the uh, particip participants will um, let you know whether or not they think that has been um, helpful. Uh, I hear from a lot of directions that the building industry in Norway is changing. It requires new uh, kinds of participation, it requires new kinds of um, collaboration, and the architecture profession has to be um, a part of that development. It, I think it requires a cultural change or a cultural adjustment for us. Um, and uh, we need to prepare not only existing um, practitioners, but also future practitioners through the education for a changing um, everyday professional life. Maybe even discuss new business models, for example, for architects, new ways of participating in the building industry and in the building industry processes. So the program for today and the speakers that you will hear have been chosen very much with that in mind. They are not only um, uh, very involved in the practice of architecture, either themselves or as part of very established uh, businesses, uh, but they also have business development, um, crucially, they have business development experience and business development uh, strategies to uh, share with you. Um, a few practical, uh, a few practical, bits of practical information. Um, coffee will kind of pull you through the day. 
So coffee will be the, the, the thing that announces when you are changing location or when you're changing mode or whatever. So there'll be a lot of coffee breaks, obviously tea and water and other healthy things as well. But, um, you know, there'll be enough coffee for everybody. Um, one of the things that have, has been a very successful part of the, our program has been to discuss issues in smaller groups with people who know uh, what it's all about. So that's what we're trying to uh, give you this afternoon. All the speakers will be available as uh, expert panels in uh, two discussion seminars. We'll divide you up. It's easier to talk. One is in English, one is in uh, Norwegian. And we'll come back to that, but that's happening this afternoon. It should be in the program that's been, on, uh, that's been put in placed on all your seats. Um, and um, toilet information and so on, and uh, Wi-Fi codes are on the wall um, down there. The discussion uh, seminars uh, this afternoon will not be streamed, uh, both because we're in two different locations, but also to encourage open uh, discussion about the things that matter to you in your business development. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Carmela Jacobi Volk, who's an architect and head of Startup Nation 2 Enterprise, SN2E, in Tel Aviv. She initiates, develops, and leads unique platforms in academic environments that are aimed at bringing ideas from academic research and experimentation out into the world. Professor Jacobi Volk has been awarded uh, several uh, prestigious research grants and prizes from different foundations and organizations, both in Israel and internationally. And her main research areas are uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, and higher education, labs, incubators and accelerators, and Israeli culture, political spatial systems, digital architecture, PBL methodologies, and participatory design, nothing less. So please welcome Carmela. <laughs> So good morning. Thank you for coming here today. Um, I would like to. Oops. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I would like to thank uh, Doga and Innova Innovation Norway for inviting me here. I'm really excited about it, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm here to learn also and see what's happening here. And uh, I would like to thank my good friend uh, Marit Hogan and Dan Zohar for insisting on me coming here for a long time now. Um, and I would like to begin with this reference. I know it's a bit of a strange reference for Israeli to begin with, but I think that the, the, create, the, create, the, the, the work itself talks by itself. And I think that... Uh, you know, when I, I was uh, born and raised in Jerusalem, and when you, in your teens, uh, were in a, you wanted to be an intellectual, it, there was a set of books you had to read. You had to read Nietzsche, you had to read Freud, and you had to read this book, okay? So it was a reference in my socialization. And this reference was very influential on my uh, personality because it made me a hungry person. It made the hunger in me a motivation to change things. I mean, I, I just could, couldn't you know, more be more uh, uh, sympathetic and empathic to this artist that is so hungry to success and food also. And it always symbolized this country in times that the hunger was the motivation of this country. And today it's not. It's different. Okay, so... Um, I'm so inspired by architecture. You know, architecture is my habitus. I do the other things today, but this is my habitus. And I, you know, I, Oslo is a wonderful city. It's a city for people. And there's so many good architects here and good architecture and, and innovative architects that, that are operating here. But I have this hate, hate and, and, and love relationship with the architecture profession. Not with architecture, but with the profession itself. And this is because I would like to, go, to get you through my ambivalence feeling about this profession. Okay, um, the idea of one career all of your life never appealed to me. Sorry. Okay? And the myth that you will be Louis Kahn at the age of 50 never appealed to me. 
I have to wait until the age of 50, there'll be somebody? No, no way. And then, and it was client-based. It wasn't a collaborative, really a collaborative profession that you talk to people, that you can change uh, ideas with people. And also, I felt that every day I innovate something, and I was confusing innovation with creativity all the time because I didn't have the skill set to do something with this creativity that I had. It was the whole creativity was for my clients and not for anybody else. So, uh, okay, you understand, right? This is it. I was a practitioner. I'm not anymore but I do practice in other ways, okay? I change along the way. And the first thing that I did, I ha had another layer to my practice. I, I was very uh, frustrated. I didn't make an impact. I wanted to make an impact. So I became a cultural entrepreneur. I, um, I uh, established and I founded a magazine, which was a very uh, unique magazine in the Israeli scene. It was a curatorial and editorial space, the magazine. And it operates also on the outside public space. We had a lot of interventions that we did in the public spaces to be activists, to say our words, to uh, impact. And I felt that I had an impact. Suddenly, I had an impact. And I, I had to, um, in Israel, the, um, the Ministry of Culture is not very supportive. So you have to recruit all the resources by yourself. And this is what I did, because I had, I had a purpose, and I wanted to fulfill that purpose. And I did a lot of stuff which were political and were social, and I was very proud of myself at last, okay? But then, five years has passed, and I wanted to do another thing. And uh, when I did that, I, all of that, I was uh, uh, from my, when, when I was 20, I went into, inside the academia. So academic career were parallel to my other career. So in that spot of time, I, I understood that I wanted to make an impact in the academia and to change the academia because I think that academia in design and architecture is quite conventional in many ways. You know, I, I know people doesn't understand that when I say that because it looks different. But it hasn't changed for a long, long time in many ways. And uh, I wanted to make a change in that sense. So when I went into, uh, when I, you know, put all my resources into academia, I did something that is um, different. I established platforms, not only academic programs, but platforms. I brought the, the model of Fab Lab to Israel. Fab Lab here is, uh, is something that you know, the Fab, the Fab Lab here? Yeah, everybody knows the Fab Lab here. It's a great Fab the best Fab Labs, I think. So uh, I brought it to Israel, this model. And it impact, the impact of this model wasn't on my student also. It was on the community, which was very, you know, very influential, very uh, significant. I also established something which is called Designers Clinic. Designers giving... Um, Designers want uh, experience, so they give their services to the community. I established all kinds of entrepreneurial projects in order uh, to make an impact on academia and change it. And also this kind of project for the different experiences and skill set of the student. I also am a researcher, or maybe I used to be a researcher. And this research is by Alexander Klein from the 1920s. I think, I happen to think that uh, housing research from the 1920s just declined since then, okay? Nothing happened since then that is better than what happened then. And he was an innovator. He was, look what he did. He invented a method, and the method was a kind of an algorithm to optimize the small unit. It's a brilliant method. Okay, and he did it all manually. You see all these drawings, okay? Each and every one is different. And he has a system of optimization of these uh, small units. Okay. And this is the world we're living in, okay? And this world is 
You know, when I look at this uh, uh, video, I feel anxiety. That's what I feel all the time. I mean, I'm operating this world and I feel anxiety. Nothing is stable. Nothing is, no actor is the one that you want, you know, you, you say, okay, this one is resilient. Nobody is resilient anymore, okay? And, you know, we have to change. We have to understand that also um, uh, our habits, our culture, and our simple need had evolved. So the profession has to change because it's about culture. It's about our need. So we need to know how can we change the profession itself and how can we operate differently. I love this picture because this picture symbolizes what I think about innovation. You see her students, master design students, okay? They are not only designers, they come from business, they come from law, they come from everywhere. And you see them, uh, and you don't understand who's the, the student, who's the lecturer, who's the, who's the innovator, who's, the, who's the, um, the collaborator, who's the expert here. And this is what innovation wants. It wants to say that everybody can innovate, and there is no better or worse. There's... There's you with your motivation to do that. And you can see the purpose in the room because everybody is uh, uh, solving problems. This is what we did in this master's degree. Solve problems. Collaborate with real life problems and solve it and create new products and services. This is one of my students, okay? He's a graduate. And he established, he has, a, he has an architecture firm in Israel, a very successful one. But he established this uh, firm by the name of Xenia. This firm is a startup. And what he does, it's analyzing and optimizing floor plan, like Alexander Klein, but by algorithm, by artificial intelligence. That's what it does. So what does it mean for us architects when these kind of products are in the market and they are more and more in the market? What does it mean? It means that we are redundant or is it, does it mean opportunity here? This is what I'm asking all the time. I mean, and let's continue asking that. You know this founder, who is he? We work, right? He's we work. And you say, this two ego collides on this image. And uh, uh, so one of them is a founder, and one of them, they call him a chief architect when he is uh, with uh, WeWork. He collaborates with, with WeWork. And I think that there's a, a, a question that is asked here. He's a chief architect of what? I mean, the design, maybe he will do something in the future, I don't know, but the design of the spaces, the co-working space of, of WeWork, Nobody knows who the designer is. There's a language there, but the designer itself, the ownership, doesn't exist. So I wonder what this two ego is going to do. But now, what WeWork does, WeWork is a real estate tech company. That's what it is. And what it does, it buys startup that do what my graduate does. I mean, they have... They, uh, uh, they have five square meters for each person in a co-working space. So they have a startup that, that, that optimizes for them the ground floor, the floors, uh, in order to do that very efficiently, okay? And they also have uh, uh, startups that is collecting data from the city in order for them to predict where is the right place to buy property for their business, okay? so. We are in a different space, okay? And this is Venn. Venn is a startup company that uh, raised $20 million only for rethinking co-housing for young people. Many, 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 you know, companies do that. Many organizations do that. But their business model was different. They were looking at the young people and say, well, you, don't, you don't put young people in a one building, Okay, and, and like old people, 
right, in a one building with amenities. You don't do that. You do it differently. You scatter them in a neighborhood. You give them a sense of community. This is the model. I mean, this model was, oper was, was you know, in, in design schools or in architecture schools, it was there. You, I saw many final projects that dealt with this kind of model, but nothing happened. And they went and did it, and they got 20 meters for it, only for developing the models. For the, they, they have now a neighborhood in Tel Aviv, they have neighborhood in Brooklyn, and they have neighborhood in Berlin that they do. Okay? And for the neighborhood uh, project, they get other budget. Okay? It's a different kind of budget. This is only for the research and development of the company. And this is Sidewalk Lab. Do you know Sidewalk Lab? Oh, yeah, you should know Sidewalk Lab. Let me tell you why you should know Sidewalk Lab. Sidewalk Lab is the, uh, uh, won the tender for developing uh, the waterfront in Toronto. Okay? Great. No? I think it's great. Yeah? Let's see what they do. This is what they do. Conceptualization phase one. Everybody loves this city. The scale of the city, the ground floor of the city, the rooftop of the city, the mixed use. Whatever we want from the city is here. You see the customization, you see everything that you want to see, okay? And then, phase two. Phase two is all of this. All of these ideas were around architecture school and architects uh, for years. And they, are, and they are doing it. They're doing it. They just collected all of this and they're doing it. Do you know who did this uh, conceptualization drawing? You don't. I don't. Nobody knows who did it, this, the conceptualization drawing because it's under Sidewalk Lab. The one who did the conceptualization drawing is like the one who developed the software. It's the same kind of attitude. It's different kind of attitude to the architecture profession. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you. Each and every item, each and every design in this city is a data collector. And this is the real business of this, okay, of this city, new city. And who is the owner of, uh, of uh, uh, Sidewalk Lab? Google, Alpha Beta. So Alpha Beta is conquering the, our spaces by subsidiary uh, uh, Sidewalk Lab, collecting our data, Treating architects like they are nothing. What else is going to be here? Okay? Well, it will raise questions. Okay, now I want to show you uh, Eleanor Gibson is asking in the zine, the one who's responsible for this, uh, um, for this uh, uh, project. He says, you're coming for an urban design background. No, he's not. He works with Bloomberg. It doesn't mean that he has an urban design background. Okay? So he said, from your experience, what qualifies technologists to be responsible for designing our cities? So he is not confused. Okay, he says, one is they, uh, one is they see how digital technology can be applied to more and more issues, more and more problems, and more and more opportunities. So guys, they can, but can we do that? Can we design cities? Because it seems somebody else is designing cities, okay? <laughs> so now this is very sad for me, okay? This is our third phase of the, pro of, of the, of the, of the project itself. So, and this is the fourth uh, uh, phase. The fourth phase, this is not me saying, this is in the zine written. Rendering, rendering, guys, by snote, this is the right word? Snoheta, sorry. Snoheta <laughs> uh, studio were used to illustrate a document outlining the update concept of... Listen, this is a firm, uh, a, a company which is one of the greatest in the world. One of the most... Uh, 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 they do, like, exquisite stuff. And they are used, used to illustrate it. Nobody wants to be used to illustrate somebody else's conceptual ideas. Why do they do that? Because they are confused. Because Google confuses you. Okay? 
The power of Google confuses you, and you shouldn't be confused. You should find your own way. Never be confused about that. Okay, so I think we established the fact that there's a disruption here. And uh, um, data-driven design, planning, and automation, it's there. And the experimental idea is that where the architectural ethos becomes the playground of tech entrepreneurs, new players in the architecture and planning system, different ownership model. There's a question of ethics versus aesthetics here, and we have to understand that. And architects are excluded from decision-making forums, and design elements are data collector, and we're asking who owns this data and, all, and control our lives. So in this phase, I would like to say that this is so important, what's happening here. This is so important that you stop this, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and think, what can we do about all of this? How can we change it? And I think it's so important that you do that, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm just uh, envy. Because in Israel, nobody does that as, as, a, as a statement. There's something else happening here, and we'll talk about it in a minute, but not as a statement as you did it. Um, and I think that all of these participants in the program, they're change maker. okay? You go to this process, and you start thinking, what will I do the next five years of my life? You became a change maker. It's inherent in the process, okay? What is my edge? What is my dream? What is the next thing I want to do? Okay, this is what you think in the process. And you get tools to do that. That's great. I'm just waiting to see what's happening. So I want to show you a little bit uh, data, okay? I, I was looking at it. Norway, a scale-up is a startup that raised $1 million, okay? So they're looking at all of Europe, uh, in this uh, um, uh, as, uh, uh, the scale up of in Europe, okay? So no, this is Norway and this is Norway. And this is Oslo. Norway, 99 scale up. Not so bad, not so good. Ma could be much better, okay? So much innovation and it could be much better. And this is Oslo. You know, uh, this is 99 scale up. 67 of them are in Oslo. You know why? Because the, Cities as a place that innovation happens, and there's a lot of potential here, okay? I was actually very surprised that Oslo is better than Zurich. There's a lot of innovation happening in Switzerland, and I was really surprised about that. So, we see her potential, okay? Next, let's see Israel, okay? Israel in comparison to Europe. Israel has 748 scale-up, and this is all of Europe, and it raised 12 billion, and this is all of Europe. And uh, in Europe, uh, um, Britain is a change maker in that sense, okay? They're the best in Europe, okay? It's a bit ridiculous because of the Brexit and what they do now, but uh, this is it. And the scale up density ratio, it means for 100,000 people, how many scale up there are? So in Israel, there are almost nine scale-up. In all of Europe, there is one scale-up to 100,000. What's happening here? I mean, Israel is a quite a hungry country, but it's a bulemic in that sense, okay? A really bulemic. And let me show you the bulemia, okay? 500, 536 multinationals. Two years ago, it was 300-something. Why do they come to either all these multinationals? Because they want to be close to innovation. They want to be close to what's happening right now. So they open hubs, an accelerator, an innovation center, and a recent development center. They do everything they can in order to be close to innovation in Israel. And there's 320 hubs in Israel. Israel, by the way, is a very small country. And there are 9 million people living in Israel. 1 million of them are not playing this play because they are ultra-Orthodox people. Okay, so it's about 800 people that are playing this game. And when you see that, 6,600 uh, 6, companies, this is really bulimic. And when it is that, you see they all do cybersecurity, digital healthcare, fintech, e-commerce, 
agri-tech, stuff like that, okay? So it's very precise what they do in Israel. And this is Norway. There's a potential here. If you look at that, you see that 2017 and 2018, it's an exponential change. It's a lot of money was raised uh, in, uh, in 2018. And when I looked at uh, six out of the 10 selected startup in Norway, they were in the area of construction tech, renewable energies, property tech, sharing economy in smart cities. Come on, guys. You have to participate in this game. It's there. It's already there. This is your edge. You can exploit it to everywhere in the world. You see, in Israel, nothing happens in that sense. Nothing, because the architecture is so bad in Israel, and nothing is invented in Israel in that sense. Nothing. Look here. There's a potential here. And look at that. Okay, there's a whole new paradigm about eco-innovation within the construction sector. And all these organizations are here to help you. And I know that you're not hungry here, and I know that you can apply here and get money from the inside, but if you get money from the outside, you know what happened? You collaborate with the outside. You get a, a different kind of market. You get, you get organization, you get collaborators, you get everyone to be on your side. You should do that. Go out. Okay, and um, um, I want to just say something about the Israeli culture. Israeli culture is what we call a fail-fast culture. What does it mean, a fail-fast culture? Uh, by nature, uh, the Israeli feels that I know better than you do. Everything I know better than you. This is why I cannot fail, because I always know better than you. So if I fail, I, you know, I recover, you know, and I continue. And I always has my buddies from the army to be next to me to support my, you know. This is Israeli culture, okay? There's a bad side to it, and there's a great side to it. And the great side to it is very compatible with the startup uh, um, culture, okay? So this is a fail fast culture. And you guys, it's what Alex Pentland, Alex Pentland is somebody that you should know for MIT, is so inventive and so, it's a different kind of a guy. Is, uh, so he says, the largest factor, he was, he was uh, uh, researching what does, what makes uh, group intelligence work. Group intelligence, it means decision making, it means problem solving. Um, you know, everything that is what group does in order to innovate. So he said the largest factor in predicting group intelligence was the equality of conversational turn taking. What does it mean? It means I don't know better than you. That's what it means. And this is your culture. This is your culture. I don't know better than you. Okay? And this has advantage. But this advantage has to be changed a little bit. There's the room to improve here, okay? So, uh, future of work. Uh, every year, the World Economic Forum uh, publish the future of work uh, report, okay? And uh, it's a very important uh, uh, report because it says that each and every one of, of us, different age of you, is going to change their career 14 times, career, 14 times in their lifetime. This is the world we're living in. What can you do? Okay, so, but for that, knowledge can be acquired, but the skill set should be there. And how would you change the skill set of people? This is questions that I ask myself for a long time now. So if you look at that, you see critical thinking, you see, uh, creativity, oh, okay, that's good for us, no? We're critical thinker, we, are cre cre uh, we have a creative mind, but people management, not so much. We think that we are a complex uh, problem solver, which is the first skill set, but we are not. You know why we're not? I had a conversation about it with Ingrid, and she said something that it is so right about architects. She said, they operate by intuition, okay? And they don't like to operate by methodologies. 
And I think methodologies are the key fact to innovation and complex problem solving. And lo and behold, when you look at what's happening in the world, the business world, look at designer, and they say, wow, they know how to think. And they formulate the design thinking. I mean, think about that. Those, biz those people from the, from the business industry, they were looking at the spreadsheets. But suddenly they understood that you have to look at people, at the users. And they looked at the design process and they said, oh, they know how to look at people. The designer didn't know it about themselves, but they knew it about this, the designer. And they formulate this design thinking methodology. Okay, and now look what happened in the world. In IBM, one out of 70 was designer ones. Now one out of 10 is a designer. And not because they design product and do the designer's conventional work, because they like his mind, they like his motivation, they like the way he thinks, they like the way he likes to change things, they like the way he knows how to try, iterate, and then again, iterate, and then again, iterate. This is what they're looking for. All of them, LinkedIn, Uber, all of them, they're looking for the designers. So there's an opportunity here, guys. Okay, really. And the business value of design is a McKinsey a, a report that was established last year. And this report was checking this idea that I'm saying right now and telling them, you know, they, they checked 300 companies, 300 companies, and, uh, they, uh, uh, and they, for five years. And what they asked, they asked, what is a... They, they, they were counting the design action in these companies, 300 companies. And design action that is more than a department of design, is more than product design, is more a feeling and more uh, than a phase. This is what they did. They checked it and, uh, and they checked designers are there from the beginning in the team. Yes, they are. Okay, this is the design action, a good design action. Uh, do they look at human-based uh, uh, product and services? Okay, this is a design action. And, wh and what they found out, that the revenue of this company was much, much, much higher than other companies. Okay, look at that. In the medical technology uh, companies, it's 100% it's more. Okay, this is amazing. This, I think this research is so important for you guys, for everybody. Okay, to understand the power of, uh, of design as a, as a changer. So let's talk about change a little bit, okay? Because, you know, I advocate change all the time, okay? How do you do that? And let's talk about a few examples. Uh... <gasps> Frank Gehry, you're a genius. Behold, the new Springfield Concert Hall. Okay. What is the big why, the purpose of Frank Gehry? It's the freedom to experiment with design. That's what he wants. He doesn't care how, the, uh, how much it costs. He doesn't care of anything. That's what he wants. So he's a responsible guy. He established Gehry Technologies. And the Gehry Technologies got investment of $50 million only for the, the R&D, for the recent development, Okay. And they also had another business model. They gave services to other firms, to Diller and Scafidio, to um, Herzog and de Moron, to the big firm. They gave services. Great, okay? Now they can do whatever they want with the experimentation. Because in architecture, you don't do much money. The revenue is not so high, okay? So what happened? Things have a life of their own. Trimble got, uh, bought them. Okay, both take very technology. I don't know for how much, but I'm sure it wasn't. It was a lot of money. So Trimble, Trimble and Gary Technology now uh, established an accelerator by the name of Zero to 60. It means they take all kinds of startups, like my student, you know, remember? Shmulik, the, 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 that's kind of a startup I hear. So it's another business model for the company, okay? And this is a young girl. You remember young girl? Yeah, young girl. Cities for people. This is it, you know? And what it 
Gelda is doing here when he was young. He went to Italy and sat down, and he was developing the methodology, how to make behavior uh, of people in a public space. What do they do? When do they do it? And he had to have a methodology for that. And he uses the methodology then to do design, strategy, exhibition, publication, research. That's what he does, okay? This is the methodology. It's a very complex methodology, but he does that. And now he has an opportunity. Now he went to Sidewalk Club. Remember Sidewalk Club? Evil. You remember them? Okay. Uh, so he made uh, an ap application that does the, the, the same methodology by application. It gives it to the people to, uh, to map their behavior in a public space. And you don't know what would happen with that because this is a valuable data that everybody would like after that. Okay? This is evolving. And this is... Landagger Group. You know Landagger Group? Yeah, everybody knows it. Okay. I looked at it. I was, I was blown out of my mind. Because what do they do? Why do they do that? Because they change maker by waste. That's what they do. They take waste as a mission in life. Okay? But they're not doing it only by architecture, which is very good, by the way. But they're not doing it by, by the architecture firm. They're doing it by architecture. Sorry about the waste, uh, uh, it's not, yeah. Uh, they're doing it by commercial company that innovate building material, commercial company, and by, uh, by the third company, which is a change perception and strategy of multiple stakeholders. Multiple stakeholders, it means multinational startup uh, uh, businesses. This land agar is all about a cycled economy, okay? And... And they establish a, a business development company that has an accelerator inside. Oh. It has an accelerator. A real accelerator from idea to value proposition. That's what they do. I mean, they have three ways to uh, fulfill the purpose. Three different ways. This is a business development, which is a brilliant one, and very, very, and, and talks about architecture of care, which is so important. Okay, so accelerator, incubator, and labs are by definition global local uh, uh, networks. You know why? Because if accelerator is good, everybody comes. Everybody from the world wants to know what's happening there. There's something that I can buy, something that I look at, I can collaborate, I can, I can uh, uh, do something with it. Everybody comes. Investor comes. Uh, people from the multinational come. Everybody comes. So by definition, when you are part of this network, you are a global change maker. And startup company, just to be uh, on the same uh, Trage is a temporary organization developing new product or service looking for repeatable, scalable business model. And I, I don't want to go inside and, and to, uh, to talk about it. I just want to tell you something about that. Accelerator and uh, are, are um, a very precise program. It's not something that you do and eat pizza and, uh, and, uh, and think about your ideas, okay? It's a precise program. It has a limited time. It has an uh, educational program, okay? And it takes you from, one, from your ID to a value proposition. It means it takes you from, the, uh, from the, the conceptual ID to the place that you know what kind of business model could be here. How do I prototype it? What is the first thing I do in order to prototype the thing, okay? And to check it with the, with the, and to see if it can be scalable, if people will want it, if it's desirable. And in incubator, in incubator, there are startups, and these startups are invested, they you invest in money, and you give them all the resources you can in order to make them companies, okay? This is it. And it's a big difference between the two, and both of them should exist, one uh, uh, next to the other. And I wanted to show you um, 
this one. It's scaling the best of the Nordics, okay? It's in the Silicon Valley, it's in New York, it's in uh, Singapore, Hong Kong. Guys, just apply. I mean, really, just apply. Who has that? That's so great. And I want to say something about the boys club. <laughs> it's a boys club. The whole startup uh, ecosystem, everywhere it's a boys club. And it shouldn't be because I know startup, the women are uh, partner and founder of this uh, startup. They are so much better because of the emotional intelligence. They are so much better. Okay? And, and not only because of everything else, but also because of the in 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 emotional intelligence. So, please, in the architect profession, there's a lot of women, right? A lot of women. I mean, at least 50% are women. Okay? It's not like that in the innovation uh, industries. You have to change, you know, and uh, when, you, when, when so many good women are in one profession, it could influence another one. <laughs> so you know that, I mean, as architect, we did it a lot for our clients, for everybody else. So this startup, which is called Envelope City, they, they do it automatically, okay? It's, it's, it's automation of the thing, okay? And it's much better than what we do because it's all the possibilities, opportunities here in, in properties. And why do I show it to you? It's because it was uh, established in Columbia University. By whom? By shop. You know, you, you know who's a shop architect? Yeah. So by shop, they did it. They were they teach in, univer in Columbia University, so they developed in the accelerator in the university. Accelerator in university is obligatory right now. It changes the skill set of the student. It makes them different, okay? And also, there is a venture capital next to this accelerator, and they invested $4 million, $4 million in this uh, venture. Okay, this is my big why, at least it was for many years. And why? Because these students, they are disillusioned. They know that they have 14 career to manage, and nobody taught them how to manage a career. So how would they do that? They don't give a shit, you know. They don't. Look at them. They're all drunk in the graduation <laughs> ceremony, okay? And this was the thing that bothered me. And this is why I established WIDIA, which is Innovation and Entrepreneurship Playground for Solving Complex Problems inside the academia. And I thought that every student should be technology literacy. Has. You know why? Because many of the architects today, will do, what will they do? They will do AR or VR uh, designs. Do they know what's AR or VR? Do they understand it? Do they understand the language? No. Does the education system teach them, and also they should know innovation and creative methodology and entrepreneurial skill set. Each and every one of them. Does architecture uh, education program, does that? Not now. No, they not. Okay, and I think it should change rapidly. It's always, it will make those students proactive. That's what it will make them. I mean, better citizen, better people, and proactive. They don't have to be entrepreneurs, but they have to have the entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, this is how they look after I, you know, there was hackathon, ideaton, ex few accelerators in the place, competition and demo days. This is how they look. There were labs, and also training for people from the outside. They came a lot. I mean, Chinese and Japanese and all of that, you know, they kept and they wanted to learn. And it was exciting because everybody was f participating in a bigger thing. I was uh, actually the vice president of the college, so this is why I could do that, okay? And there's a methodology to the things. And I won't go, go inside this methodology, but I want to tell you, you can, I, you can learn these methodologies. It's there for you. You want me to uh, go back?
Okay. So um, all of this, all these value creations, um, I, would, I wrote something here that I want uh, to read you. Each one of us would like to have an impact, to change the world, even a little. This is why we have become architects and designers in the first place. This is our chance. The playground has changed. There are many more opportunities globally and locally. We have to overcome our anxieties and collaborate with the big actors to become change makers. Um, we should constantly think, what makes us happy? What is our edge? Do we identify a problem that we would like to solve? Do we have a purpose, at least for the next five years? It can iterate, it can change by making, by prototyping, by collaborating. Eventually, it will, it will create a value. So don't forget, be hungry. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carmela. I hope uh, that uh, you are all uh, filled with burning questions that you will get to ask uh, this afternoon. Yeah. And if you think that uh, this doesn't have anything to do with me, I don't understand what the hell she's talking about, great, because then uh, that is really what today is all about. Um, if the, unless there is something you don't know, how can you ever change? Um, our next speaker... This is when I need an assistant. Um, oh. Sorry. Yay. Our next speaker um, has a very interesting take on Scandinavian design. He comes from Canada, uh, but he has worked for many years in Denmark in the development of the firm Tregang Nielsen or 3XN, as they are now known internationally. And today he is a partner of that firm and also Director of Communications and Business Development. 3XN is one of the locomotives of internationalization of Danish business uh, development in architecture. And uh, Jack has been a fantastic resource for the Architecture Go Global program. Uh, from the expert panel that selected uh, the participants initially um, and to sharing his knowledge and his methods and his firm's methodology very generously throughout the program and sharing it with you today. So, uh, welcome, Jack. Okay, and, so yeah. I, and I can just yeah, forward can, this yeah. one. Okay, great. Well, uh, that's going to be a tough act to follow. <laughs> that was really inspiring. Thank you so much, Carmela, because, you know, in, in the past two years, you know, I realized uh, after speaking with Margaret that it, it was in August 2017 that the panel selected the seven different architecture firms that would participate in this program. And, and in two years, an incredible amount has happened in internationalization. And the, the, the arrival of tech into all of this has just changed all of it. And I mean, I think it was really, really interesting to hear your presentation because this, this is now what we're going to have to deal with. We're, we're now, um, we're now when, when we go internationally, we're now actually having to engage with different actors than, than we originally had thought we would have to. It's changing before our eyes. And so that's very, very exciting. What I'm going to do today is actually give a little bit of a recap of the presentation that I had given uh, at the initial stages, which were kind of my methodology for going global. Because for the past 10 and a half years, I've been working for 3XN as um, the Director of International Business Development and for um, communications. And it, it didn't start that way because I'm not an architect. I am actually um, an economist uh, and I did a Master's of International Business at Norges Handelshøyskole. Um, many of you know me already, so you, you will have heard this story already, but I, I studied in 1997, 98, or maybe 98, 99 in, in Bergen at the NHOHO. 
and I know I forgot. <laughs> Maybe that's good. And uh, lived one and a half years there. And it was really incredible because I got a very good understanding of what a business education would be in Norway. And then I moved here uh, to Oslo and worked for L'Oreal in Sandvika um, for one and a half years. And that was also very interesting because I got to know all the towns in, 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 Oz in Norway and, and also understood how an international business, like a French business, operated in Norway. And so it was very fascinating. And from there, I went back to Canada and um, worked there and eventually got hired by the Danish Trade Commission um, to, uh, to, to promote different Danish sectors and eventually to promote Danish architecture. Because in 2017, um, there was something interesting that came out called the Danish Architecture Policy. And it was a document that was put together by seven different government agencies, which I think is kind of amazing that seven different agencies can put together um, you know, one document that's so coherent and really set out settings for life and growth. And it was kind of ten principles for what they thought should be the ideal settings for life and growth, which comprised this Danish architecture policy. And that was a great document for me to be able to use to promote Danish architecture, because I was able to go out and talk about what made Danish architecture different. And in 2014, this document was updated, and I think they actually titled it absolutely bang on right, putting people first. And I also liked that in the foreword of this document, they started talking about what actually defined Danish architecture and put it in words that were easier to understand. Danish architecture has helped shape our welfare society into a form that is characterized by humanism. Humanism. That was a very, very important word because I could walk into a, a city planning department and talk about the users. I could talk about this is the Danish approach and it's not just Danish, it's, it's Nordic. <laughs> the architecture reflects our democratic and transparent society. That was also very powerful to be able to say. And then the, the, the Danish architecture policy says, it binds us together and gives us an identity, both in local communities and nationally. And so that's why there's an increased international demand for Danish design that focuses on people. Around the world, this is becoming a big thing. And so I also like the last line in the foreword of this policy where it says, so in order to harness the potential that is out there right now in the increased international demand, it's important that the companies in the architectural industry also focus on internationalization and commercial business development. And so that, that actually was really very helpful in being able to go out and talk about what is it that differentiates us. Why choose a Danish firm, a Nordic firm, as opposed to another Canadian or another American firm, or the cheapest firm, for that matter? What is it that sets us apart? And so I, um, I eventually moved to Copenhagen and started working in the office there. And I moved in 2009, which was a really, really good year, if you might remember it. It was uh, the year of a very major financial crisis. And at that time, um, we at 3XN had 80% of our business in Denmark and 20% of it outside of Denmark. Uh, last financial year, we had 87% of our business outside of Denmark. In the last 10 years, we have really turned the ship around in a different way. And it was, there's nothing like a financial crisis to make you decide to go international. I would say it wasn't one of these things where we said, oh, it would be so nice to go abroad. It, was, it would be, you know, interesting. Because, you know, <laughs> when we went abroad, we made a lot of mistakes. We, we really went through a lot. I said to my boss, you know, if I leave, you know what's going to make me so valuable? I made all the mistakes already, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that, that really... But no, 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 there's lots more mistakes to make, that's for sure. Um, so what I want to show you today is um, I'd like to discuss some of the key decisions that we made along the journey of going international, some of the mistakes and the successes, but more importantly, I want to give you a, an overview of a framework that has allowed us to enter markets in a much more comprehensive way in a way that has allowed us to gain credibility within that market and to deepen the networks that we needed. Um, 
And so what I'll basically go through is, you know, the, how we chose the right market for, for our office, because this is important. Selecting the right market for your firm. Um, the five spheres of business development, and that's what I'm going to focus on mostly, because I think it's possible to actually have multiple workshops out of this presentation. The work split between consultants, once you actually start getting a, a project and working in another market, the way that you select your consultants and, and maybe want to um, base your, your, your scope of work matrix. And then at the end, like, you're in a new market and you're going to be approached by new clients for new projects with different kinds of fee structures and different kinds of contracts. And so I'll really, really very briefly only touch on those and then we can always talk later. Um, so the right market for your firm, you know, 2009 was a very interesting year and the building industry was very, very slow. Uh, we had to close one of our offices and lay off 60 people. It was very, very tough. And so there was a part of the world that was absolutely booming and that was the Middle East, like the Abu Dhabi and Dubai really just started pumping money into new city development. And so I was part of this Danish delegation to participate in an architecture congress called Cityscape. Um, uh, and in, uh, it was in Abu Dhabi and it was dazzling. You know, I mean, I couldn't believe it. The size of the buildings, they were massive. And there seemed to be no end to the possibilities. I mean, I remember seeing, you know, the sheikh arrive at this conference and he came with like 50 white cars. I had never seen anything like this. It was, uh, it was more than a movie. And so, of course, I was calling back to Copenhagen saying, oh my God, like we need to start looking at, 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 at meetings here and stuff. And so we were invited into competitions. And I'm very thankful for that because they really kept us going. We, we did some amazing work. We, we were involved in the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Center arena, and we were able to kind of push the boundaries of, of some of the stuff that we were doing. Um, but what we started realizing was, how does a Danish firm with a very Danish staff start working in another market that is very different from ours? We were literally being called at three in the morning for meetings. Um, we, 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 were, we encountered the hierarchy that we didn't have in Denmark. And in that hierarchy, every boss of every boss wanted to change something. And, and then there was like, forget redesign fees. There was no, 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 no change order. Mm -mm, no, 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 no. So in a Danish context, where in our office every hour is paid, where the architect's professional advice is, is often listened to, this was devastating our bottom line. We were working around the clock and knowing that the cycle wasn't going to end. And we realized this isn't, this, we weren't ready for this. And I, I think it's very important that I also not say that's not the market for you, because it could be. You know, we also tried in China, and we can also see one of our competitors has a fantastic business going in China. But what it comes down to is what is your office ready for now? What are the first steps you can start taking and what feels right? And what are you set up for? I think now we would actually be quite okay to go into Abu Dhabi. We would probably have the setup and the people that would want to, to do it. But back then, it made us look very hard and carefully at which markets do we want to be in in our home market, which was, of course, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. And how would we approach those? The near markets, which we kind of considered Europe, and then the far markets. Which far markets did we really want to work in? And so for each of those markets that we entered, we decided to put together a very comprehensive strategy of how we would go into the market. And now in, in some cases, you know, you may actually have a project and in, in, you may have been approached to go in and, and actually do a project in one. And that that will help you to start getting a foothold and start developing your, your network and, and your strategy for that market. In other cases, it might be something totally new. You might say, well, I can see that things are happening in Denmark. Maybe, maybe we should start looking at that as, a, as a, a possible next step. And so for each market, what we tried to do was look at how would we develop a list of clients and collaborators that we would want to work with? How would we try to build our profile 
with the media and use them to our benefit? How would we connect with the academic world and how would we try and have an exchange of knowledge with them and build our credibility within that? How do we link with the cultural organizations or the professional associations that are there? And how do we introduce ourselves to the local authorities and show them that we're doing something different? Well, this is, this is where you can dive in and go as deep as you want. And it's also where you can just dip your toe in a little bit. It's a way to start framing your whole approach into a new market. And so I'm not saying this is what's going to work for everybody, but I think it's, it's actually a good way of uh, starting to think when you are thinking of going into a market. Let's, let's take a look at these things. I, when I go into a new market, I like to think of who would be my dream clients here. Who would I really, really want to work with? And be careful, again, what you wish for, because sometimes you do end up working with, you know, Mr. Weston. You know, he, he was... Like some, he, he was like the most amazing businessman in Canada, and I always thought, wouldn't it be incredible to work with him? And of course, sent a book. And it was like three years later, he asked to come and visit our office and flew over in a private plane. And I just thought, it's amazing. Like, if you really, you know, it's surprising what things can happen sometimes. But y you should dream big. Write out that list of who you would love to work with in that, in that market. And then figure out how you can actually start maybe getting some introductions or meetings or try to set up a meeting program around that. It's important for you to look at what you do, your body of work with your firms right now that set you apart from everybody else in that market. And so that's where the Danish architecture policy really helped me out. Because the things that we do as 3XN are not, are not just 3XN. I, mean, I think they're actually quite Danish. And I, I think they're, it's a... Again, like not just Danish either, it's very Nordic. We're looking at people-centered design, we're looking at design that focuses on the public realm. We have a particular perspective here that is very welcome out there. And so highlighting those when meeting with potential clients is very important. And then, of course, looking at who you would collaborate with. When we work abroad, we, of course, work with a local architect. And in Canada, it was extremely important for us to connect with that local architect very early on in the stage, and I'll show you that a little bit later. But it was so important to actually understand how do you build in Canada? What construction methodologies are you using? What are the materials palette? Um, show us some buildings that are built here in Toronto so that we understand how, they, how they're done and so that we see these first before we even start our own design. It's very important. Our local architect in Toronto also came to Canada, or to Denmark, and saw how our, of our office operates. We were able to discuss things very early on, like BIM protocols and all of those types of things that allowed us to start the journey together in the right way. Um, then media. This is becoming increasingly important. Um, Carmela showed us a photo of someone who absolutely disrupted the way that communication has been done in the architecture business. Bjarke Ingels has absolutely smashed apart what we thought was the way that we communicated architecture. And in the beginning, I remember 10 years ago, we were kind of like, oh, that's so irritating. He has to always post something. You know, why, why did every magazine, oh, Bjarke again, you know. And we just thought, oh, we, we, don't, we don't do that. Now we do. Now we certainly do. We have, we have an Instagram, we have like our Facebook, we have, uh, you know, every kind, we have one person only taking care of social media. Um, and we're lucky to do so. We didn't have that for a very long time. Um, and now we're realizing how important it is. The media in all its forms, whether it's print media, whether it's blogs, whether it's, um, it's social media, is very important for us to engage with so that we can communicate how we would like to be perceived on that market. And it can come across wrong as well. We do need to actually talk about why, in a genuine sense, we're truly an interested in entering Canada, for example. I'm going to give you a lot of Canadian examples because it's been the, the market that we've been working on the most the past uh, few years. But, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that sometimes you can have a backlash when you go into a new market. We experienced this in Australia, where we won uh, a big 50-story tower at the Central Business District of, of Sydney, and then we won a big fish market there, and then a university building. And all of a sudden, there were a whole bunch of letters 
from the Architects Association and members of the Architects Association in, in, in Australia saying, why are all these international architects getting our work? And that, that's a bit scary. <laughs> in Canada, we've taken a really um, deep dive into connecting with the local community, in holding community workshops, in doing joint panel discussions where we have Canadian experts and Danish experts talking about what we can learn from each other instead of coming across as where the, we know it all. You know? I think it, that's a very, very important thing. And that's the kind of thing that can come across in your interactions with the media. Um, we try to have regular uh, meetings with, with key uh, journalists, invite them in to see the process of the work that we're doing. Um, and then I also, I, I mentioned social media already. Then um, academia. This has been very important, especially in, um, in establishing credibility. You know, when you go to a school and say, I'm happy to give a lecture if you'd ever like, I mean, that's, that is a gift. The knowledge you have and the perspective you have of coming from the Nordic countries and going into a new market and saying, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the architecture we do, and especially for students, is it's a very, very good way of establishing a network with other professors, the architecture schools, and the students. So um, we try to have a regular series of different guest lectures and programs um, with uh, different universities uh, throughout the world. And then one of the side things that happens is you have all the students that come up to you afterwards and say, do you do internships? And so we, we have to, we, we, we've started some internship programs that have worked really good. I, I've been very, very surprised at how well they've, they've um, how well it's worked out for us because when I first started at 3XN 10 and a half years ago, I think there were two or three of us that were non-Danes. Um, now we are 17 different nationalities and over 50% of the office is non-Danish. But we still say, we are a Danish firm that works internationally. We have actually attracted some really brilliant minds from around the world that have, in some ways, kind of helped us look at what the DNA of the office is even more, and has helped us articulate even more what it is we do. Because their observations, they're looking at our work and viewing it with fresh eyes. So it's been, it's been very nice. The next thing is um, the cultural and professional organizations. With the cultural organizations, there can be some art galleries, architecture galleries, that at a certain stage can make sense for you to hold an exhibition or to connect with and, and also hold panel discussions or, or, or whatever. We, um, we just opened an exhibition in Toronto um, on the Bayside where we're building four buildings. And the exhibition is called Waterfront Architecture, Placemaking and Context. And it's an exhibition of all of our projects that we've ever done along the waterfront. And we're kind of trying to weave this thread by including Toronto there and saying, uh, we're trying to bring the best of what we've learned around the world to this site. But then we were told, um, you know, you put up an exhibition, everybody comes for the opening, they all clap, and then, and then nobody comes, right? And we thought, well, that's, that's a good point. So what we held was a thought leadership series. We teamed up with Rockwell and got them to sponsor it. And then what we did was we, we invited experts to come and speak on different themes. And that was, that was the way that we were also able to really connect with the community on the site right across from Sidewalk Labs, actually, right in front of it. So it's important that our projects are viewed as like community-centered, uh, focus on the hu uh, uh, on human centered design public realm you know in a very positive light because we know that the site around us is, is has some you know controversy um, professional networks this is also very important there are going to be professional networks within that market that of course are going to be important for you to connect with but also global ones and one of those I might tell you about is ULI urban land institute I've been a member of ULI now for four years this is quite interesting. A lot of people don't know about it. And that's, um, that's interesting because 60% of its members are real estate investors and developers. Only 5% are architects. And so four years ago when I joined, I was like, wow, this is fantastic. It's everybody is a potential client here. You know, it was wonderful. 
it's in, important to research a little bit about who these groups and networks are because you can actually learn a lot from them. In the past four years with ULI, which is holding a conference in Copenhagen next month, by the way, I'll have some of these, <laughs> um, what I learned was how to think like my client. I, I realized, okay, now that we're working in North America, we're actually being told a lot more optimization of the floor plate, we're talking about tenant uh, fit-outs, we're in a more of an intense way than we experienced in Denmark. And it's because they have different business plans. And I really learned a lot from that, actually. I was very happy. And I'm, I was able to come back and meet with my partners and say, we have to start thinking the way that our clients think, or at least understand how they think. And then finally, professional associations like REBA in the UK, AIA in, in, in the US. Um, not only is it good to become part of those networks, but there are also certain licenses and uh, formalities that you would also find that you'll have to actually um, investigate and, and apply for and, and in order to, to operate in, in that, that market. And then um, finally, I think it's a very good idea to meet with the local authorities. If you don't have a project yet, you can walk into the city planning department and say hello. Once you have a project that's in, uh, you know, in an application for planning permission, then you can't so much. We, we had a great opportunity um, a few years ago when we met with Waterfront Toronto. There's a very powerful organization that um, is overseeing the whole redevelopment of the waterfront in Toronto. And they, um, we went in and just made a presentation. And we, we asked them, like, what is important for you in the development of this? And they said they gave us a lot of their goals and objectives. And then they also told us, you know, if you're ever doing a competition or if you're ever doing a sketch proposal, bring it by us. You can show us and, and we'll comment on it. And so I did that. And that was very interesting because our client afterwards was blown away. They actually realized by the very fact that Waterfront Toronto had already seen our proposal, almost guaranteed that it would be given a check mark. So it was, it was a very nice way of almost seeming naive, like, you know, the neighbor that goes and knocks on the other neighbor's door and says, hello, I just wanted to introduce myself. This is, use it to your advantage. I mean, it was, you can walk into any door going into a new market because you're the newcomer and you have something to offer. So those, that's a very general overview of, of some of the steps that we have taken when we've been going into a new market. And I, I you know, I, I know it's not for everybody, but I do think it is worth thinking you know, along some of these lines, and you might have actually more spheres, of course, that you want to add into them as well. But it's helped us in at least formulating a plan and an approach for each market that we go into. And then what the other thing is it's a lot of work. It's a, <laughs> a real lot of work. So what we have to do as well is be very focused on the markets that we want to go into. So if just doing this for Canada is taking up you know, X amount of our time, we have to think, do we have this amount of time to go into France? Do we have this amount of time to go into Switzerland? So this is kind of the view that we're taking. I'll just very briefly go over a few other things here. Once you do start working with a local uh, in the new market, it is going to be very important to choose your local architect very carefully. This is a very general you know, split of work, and you've probably all seen this before, you know, where in the concept and schematic design phases, uh, the design architect is the primary architect. And this is, this is quite nice. You know, this is the kind of work you can actually do pretty much from your office, wherever it is, and have a few interactions with, uh, with the local architect. I like to involve them right in the very beginning. You still have to travel. There's no getting out of that. But you can use your entire office and the, the bench of knowledge that you've had over all of the years to do the conceptual design and the schematic design. Once you start going into design development, that's where our scope of work matrix shifts a lot more work over to the local architect. And then, of course, they're taking care of construction documentation and they're on site all the way through to the closeout. And so this is a very general um, thing. I would say that we might do facade design all the way up to here. You know, so it's, you, you go through what is called a scope of work matrix, which is a very, very important document. And it outlines every deliverable for every phase of the project. 
And I like to spend a lot of time on that. I go through it line by line, and it doesn't matter if they're frustrated with me. I really <laughs> insist on going through that line by line because this serves as your roadmap for the next four to six years. And if you plan that carefully and really determine what they're going to be responsible for and what you're going to be responsible for, you've agreed to it, and th or they've agreed to it. And then it's something that you can actually work through later. If it's very general, and you think, oh, we'll solve that when we get there, mm -mm. it's especially, like, you know how hard it is to do that in your own market. Think of when you're dealing in another language and in another culture. So that, I, so for our project in Sydney, Australia, we spent a, a month and a half working on the scope of work matrix. And um, I, even my boss would come and he's like, are you still working on that? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Because it's uh, it's it's important it's important to to do. Um, uh, so you're going to inevitably then be come up with you're going to have new new clients. Um, people are going to come to you and and they're going to be very excited to to work with you. And I you know I'm always very flattered when we have people come and and talk to us. But you should also recognize who you are as firms. You're coming with very specialized knowledge. You are going to be very popular. And I think it's um, super important for you to be able to, um, to be selective. I like to say 10 times no and one time yes. I think it's very important to do the research on who a potential client could be. I always want to see their portfolio. What have they built before? What other architects have they worked with before? You know, so many times they come to me and they say, oh, we're going to be your doorway into this market. You know, if, if you work with us, it'll be your first project in, in, in London. I'm like, well, you know, that's nice. But I know we already work with good clients, and you will also be a good client. But that's not going to make me reduce my fees, if that's what they're trying to get at. Um, I also want to visit their buildings. What, is, what are the buildings that this potential client wants to uh, hire me for or hire us, our firm for? I want to see what they've done in the past. Where have they skimped on, on, on the process? Um, and also financing. I, I think that's also super important to look at. What, what are they, um, who's financing the project? Is it a pension fund? Is it uh, an individual investor? because this will also uh, impact the, the project. Sometimes, of course, they come and they, especially for cultural buildings in North America, they say, can you do a sketch phase and then we're gonna use that to do fundraising? Mm, well, thanks. Um, then there's the organization, how, how you're going to have your, your workflow together, your project management that, that needs to be considered, and fees. Fees are very important. I mean, sorry, this whole thing is, uh, it's a whole other th uh, lecture, but I, I want you to, to take a look at these as well because these are things that you're going to have to spend a lot of time thinking about. If you saw that, that uh, split, this is where the fees are, but the client will always want the fees all the way through here. And so it means that your fee structure and the way that you build that has to change. And uh, so, that, that, that's definitely something to think about. And then contracts. We, we look through contracts um, internally, but I always hire a lawyer um, in whatever market I'm in to go through that contract with me. There are some things that I just can't get around, some things I have to accept because that's what's required in that market. And then that means I have to buy an insurance that covers those types of things. So those are other considerations to, to be thinking about as well. So, sorry this was so quick, but I, I really wanted to give a, a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, and, uh, you know, if there are some more questions, we can discuss that in the afternoon. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. Incredibly, it's already lunchtime. Um, we...
as you can see from your watches or from your phones, uh, we're a little bit lax on the timekeeping. It's really incredible to have these people here today and have them share their inside knowledge uh, with us. So uh, it seems ridiculous to cut them off for the sake of five minutes or whatever. Um, I really hope that you also take the opportunity to talk to them in the breaks and in the seminars in the afternoon. And if you're thinking that, you know, really my boss should be here, geez, my other partners should be here, to the extent that you have a business development manager, he or she should be here, call them. You know, if you think that they should join the seminar later or come in later when we have a discussion session, call them. And uh, we've always got room for uh, more people. But now it's lunchtime. Uh, it's, uh, the lunch is being served downstairs in the atrium. So you go down the stairs and then you go down the stairs again. So go as far down as you can. It's not in the cafe. Um, it's all the way down the stairs. Um, and coffee is the uh, great uh, gatherer. So that will be served again up here at 12.40 sharp. Okay, so we use the breaks to adjust the uh, time. So welcome back at 12.40.
everybody, and welcome back after a quick lunch. Carmela. <laughs> Um, Arkitektur ute i verden er en del av et program finansiert av Kulturdepartementet, som uh, Margit har uh, sagt. Og uh, hensikten er å utvikle uh, eksportsatsingene i kreative næringer. Og det er en stor glede for mig å kunne introdusere denne hilsen fra kulturminister Trine Skei Grande. Kjære arkitektur ute i verden, jeg skulle veldig gjerne vært til stede på avslutningskonferansen. Dette har vært en veldig viktig satsing for regjeringen. Det å få norske bedrifter og norske kreative næringer ut og bruke hele verden som marked jeg har alltid vært viktig for oss. Jeg vil skryt veldig av de sju bedriftene som nu har vært med på å utvikle dette prosjektet. Og jeg synes det skal bli spennende å se hva dere får ut av det, og hvordan dere kommer til å jobbe noe videre med denne kreative næringen. Og så vil jeg si tusen takk til Innovasjon Norge og til Doga, som har vært med på å utvikle dette prosjektet. Jeg tror at vi har et stort potensiale for å også spre norske kreative næringer rundt omkring i verden. Og dere har vært med på å virkelig lagt en ny standard for å utvikle sånne type programmer. Så tusen takk for at dere har vært med å utvikle dette sammen. Jeg heier veldig på at vi skal klare å utvikle dette videre også. Og jeg skulle veldig gjerne ha vært der og snakket med dere, men jeg håper dere får en flott konferanse uansett. Let me introduce the um, next speaker. As Turinger said initially, Danish architects are now getting 25, 28 anyway, an impressive proportion of their turnover from international projects. And in Norway, the same figure is extremely low. And at the same time, we're selling the same product internationally um, in the international market. As, for, as soon as you set foot outside of Scandinavia, no one, except us, of course, care whether you come from Norway or Sweden um, or Denmark. We all represent the same values, the same product, if you like, in the international marketplace. And here to tell us more about how that came about, the Danish success, is Lars Emil Krag, the head of business development and projects at Danske Arkitektvirksomheter, the Danish Association of Architectural Firms. Varsågod, Lars Emil. Skal jeg forsøge på dansk? Skal vi prøve det? Det gør vi. Jeg sagde til Ingrid, at vi har sådan en lille sprog, eller udtryk, vi kalder Danglish på dansk. Det er sådan en sammentrækning af Danish og English. Mest af alt dækker det over, når vi som danskere kommer til at bruge forkerte engelske ord. Så jeg prøver at blande lidt. Nogle af slidesene vil være på engelsk, men jeg forsøger at sige ordene. På dansk. Vil du have den? den vil jeg gerne have, tak. Kort om, øh, jeg var, øh, tak for invitationen, rigtig mange tak for invitationen. Jeg har glædet mig til at komme i dag, og var øh, også i den situation, at jeg var inviteret, da I var i Danmark i, på den februar. Nor, ja, februar, ja, på den norske ambassade, og det var en meget, meget fin fortælling, og så jeg har set, der er nogle kendte ansigter, også her, og jeg var meget imponeret over, det I faktisk kan, så jeg kan ikke forstå, at I ikke er noget større i udlandet. Og så kigger jeg på jer arkitekter. Men I skal nok komme efter det, er jeg sikker på. Se, Danske Arkitektvirksomheder, eller som står der op, Danish Association for Architectural Firms, det svarer til arkitektbedrifterne. Vi er cirka 650 medlemmer i Danske Arkitektvirksomheder. Et af medlemmerne, det er blandt andet 3XM. Et af de større medlemmer, hvor vi også har direktøren med i bestyrelsen, så det er en vigtig, et vigtigt medlem, så... Tak, fordi du også vil have mig her, Jack. Det er jeg glad for. Øhm, derudover, så kan man sige, ud af de 650 medlemmer, hvis vi så lige zoomer ind på, hvor mange af dem har egentlig en eller anden form for international omsætning eller ambition om at være det. Og der kan vi måske sige 10-15 procent. Flere er det ikke. Men, og dem, der ligesom er ud af dem, det vil sige omkring 95, maks 95 cirka, af dem er nogen, som kommer på den anden side af vandene rundt omkring Danmark. 
Og der er et sted, hvor vi er forbundet med, med Tyskland helt præcist i Jylland. Så, øh, så det, ellers så skal man krydse vand. Det er sådan set øh, os, som, som, og vi er jo så dem, der skal repræsentere virksomheden, og det prøver vi at gøre på forskellige leder kanter. Øh, og det, jeg vil tage igennem, det er sådan set lidt en lille historie, som ser cirka sådan her ud. Jeg kommer til at fortælle omkring situationen, hvad står vi i i dag, hvilken kompleksitet afføder det, og hvilke løsninger har vi så kigget på. Det er sådan de tre ting. Så jeg kommer kun til at diskutere lidt, øh, og det, det, så stort sted er, er det nøgen, at der er nogen spiller engelsk? Uh, yeah. Så jeg bliver på det danske, og så må I sige til, om det skal være mere nordisk, altså så skandinavisk eller noget. Så. Ja. Hvad kan jeg tage, siger du? Tallenen. Åh oh, ja, det kan jeg forsøge. Ja, præcis. Ja. Uh, vores 650 med, og så har vi 10-15 procent, som er på en eller anden form for, det vil sige max 90 øh, har en eller anden form for ambition om at gå. Jeg ved faktisk ikke om 90. Er det svensk eller norsk? Ja, det er også norsk. Det siger man også på svensk. Nå, fint. Så har vi den klart. Øh, se, se, positionen den handler meget om, hvor, hvad har vi gjort som organisation? Hvad står vi ude i? Hvilke kompleksiteter medfører det? Og hvad har vi så gjort for at løse det? Hvor end det måtte være super interessant at diskutere value proposition, og den værdikæde, som alle arkitektvirksomheder er presset af i dag. Personligt har jeg svært ved at se, at den forretningsmodel, som eksisterer i dag, den også eksisterer om fem år. Men det er en anden historie. Det er ikke det, vi taler om i dag. Det var noget af det, som Camilla hun fortalte os lidt om, at der sker en masse rundt om os i branchen. Jeg er ikke selv arkitekt. Jeg er også, som Jack, en økonom af baggrund, marketing fra CBS, jeg har været i Dansk Arkitektvirksomhed i fire år. Godt fire år, og før det har jeg fungeret som, øh, i reklamebranchen, som ikke er øh, alligevel lidt analog til arkitektbranchen. I hvert fald det der med at deltage i en masse konkurrencer og tabe en masse penge, øh, og, og, så, og måske kunne vinde lidt senere. Ellers så har jeg været innovations- og udviklingschef i store organisationer, og har nu øh, den glæde at repræsentere arkitektfirmaer i øh, som forretningsudvælger, Head of Business Development, betyder altså at hjælpe med at kigge ind i sit eget maskinrum, men også hjælpe med at kigge ud af verden, eller ud af landets grænser. Og det er det, vi står i i dag. Se, den første del, den her, som jeg kalder situationen, jeg vil sige, der går ikke én dag, uden at jeg ikke får en henvendelse fra nogle af dem, der arbejder med internationalisering. Dansk industri, jeg ved ikke, om det hedder, hvad er det, det hedder i nærings, dansk næringsliv, eller næringsliv, eller sådan den store organisation, hvad hedder den i Norsk? Uh, altså, hvor de kommer til en og siger, vi vil så gerne have, at der kommer nogle arkitekter og fortæller en fantastisk historie. Det vil de. Altid. Der går ikke en dag, uden de gør det. Og det er, det er, jo, det er jo sådan set posen, og det gør de jo, fordi I er gode til at fortælle historier og er enormt sexet. Altså, det er sådan er det. Det, er, det har, har jeg ligesom fundet ud af, det er det, det handler om. Uh, at at det, uh, det kører det hele ned til, at I kan bare noget, som andre ikke kan. Så, øh, og så kan man sige, hvad er det så for en historie? De så, øh, og så kommer de altid, og så beder de om, og no og Jack, så siger de altid de samme. Her opstår, de beder om usual suspects. Og det er ikke noget forkert. Men, men mange af dem, som ikke kender branchen indenfra, de spørger efter de samme. I så Jan Gehl lige før. Han er en, øh, han er en world star. I, hør, I så Big, altså Bjarke Engels. Og nu har I set Jack, Altså, I, altså, vi har nogen, som er nogle rigtig, rigtig store spillere på den internationale scene. Og så har vi et lag to. Altså, man kan sige, hvis jeg skulle tælle på hænderne, dem I kunne nævne, kunne I måske nævne 10 danske store arkitektvirksomheder. Måske 12. Men vi har altså op til 90. Der er nogle af de andre. Og det er dem, vi som organisation også skal sørge for at hjælpe. For de er også dygtige. Og vi har et navn i udlandet, som gør, at vi kan sælge meget mere nordisk. Læg mærke til, at jeg skrev jo skandinavisk, altså positioning Danish eller Scandinavian. Så det er det, det handler om her. Ikke? Så øh, det her er sådan set det, vi står i dagligt. Altså, at der kommer nogle konstant, der spørger efter nogen, og de spørger efter de samme, så jeg prøver at brede det lidt ud. Og så det, der er den sidste udfordring, når de kommer og spørger, at de ved faktisk ikke rigtigt, hvad det er, en arkitekt laver. 
De kommer og så ser dem, de er så gode til billeder, og de kan vise nogle flotte ting. Men hvordan I er kommet frem til de løsninger, I er kommet frem til, det er der meget, meget, meget få mennesker, der ved. Så vi gik i tænkeboks og tænkte, hvad kan vi gøre et eller andet, som kan hjælpe det, vi kalder ambassadører? Fordi øh, det kunne man jo overveje lidt. Jeg skal lige se, den er blevet til en pdf, så jeg kan ikke følge med her, så jeg gør lige sådan her for min egen skyld. Ja. Øhm. Som sagt, så er der altså nogen, der vælger det godt. Men de ved bare ikke rigtigt, hvad det er, I laver. Og så skal vi prøve at finde ud af, at nu taler jeg for dansk, men jeg kunne lige så godt have talt i et nordisk perspektiv. Det samme gælder for jer. Det ved jeg fra arkitektbedrifterne. Så situationen det er den her. Altså kompleksiteten. Det er bare, at vi tænkte, hvis vi nu kan, kan, vi, kan vi få dem til at fortælle den historie om, hvor fantastiske arkitekter er til at løse verdens udfordringer. Så kommer der to ting ind. Det her, den har været sjovere, hvis der nu var kommet klik by klik, fordi lige præcis sætning nummer to, øh, arkitekter kan godt lige høre på sig selv. Nu ved jeg ikke, om, om jeg lige skal have nordmænd over en kamp her, men i hvert fald danske arkitekter er meget vilde med at lytte lidt på sig selv. Og så er de jo meget, meget bange for, om nu de andre, dem som i virkeligheden skal tale, kan de nu sige det rigtige? Eller går det galt? Så øh, de overvejelser har vi haft i vores øh, fokusudvalg, som det hedder, i bestyrelsen i Dansk Ark, og sige, ah, det er nok bedst, hvis vi kan finde en vej, hvor vi kan lære nogen at sige det, som vi gerne, de gerne vil have, de skal sige, fordi det er lettere, og de spreder ringene meget hurtigere. Så det, det gik vi gik sådan set lidt i gang med. Så tilbage til, øh, hvad gjorde vi? Jamen, vi prøvede sådan set at interviewe det her, jeg kalder det stakeholders eller ambassadører. Og dem, som på en eller anden måde arbejder med, det kunne også være Kultur- og Det kunne være det, der hedder Trade Commission, der hvor Jack kan oprindeligt være ansat fra. Hvad er det for nogen? Hvilke sprog taler de, og hvem taler de om og med? Så gik vi i gang med at interviewe en masse af dem, og vi fandt ud af, hvad er det, de siger? Hvad siger de egentlig om danske arkitektvirksomheder? Hvad siger de egentlig? Og så prøvede vi ud af det at lave et koncept. Sådan, som kunne ramme det hele ind. Altså noget af det, som Jack har fortalt i dag, altså der kommer jo stadigvæk noget, som er individuelt, men der er noget, der bygger lidt på den her, faktisk den her arkitekturpolitik. Den er ikke forkert. Så det, den står vi også en lille bitte smule på ryggen af. Og så kan man sige, at vi kørte nogle workshops efterfølgende, og så blev det så til noget, som jeg vil vise jer en lille smule af. Vi er ikke færdige endnu, men vi er på vej. Se, først så startede vi med, her der har vi nogle, det er inde i vores fokusudvalg, det er inde i Industriens Hus i København. Vi gik i gang med os alle de her tavler, det er noget med, hvad er det, vi kan kode ned til, og vi diskuterede, og vi gjorde ved, og vi endte faktisk med at lave det her. Vi hyrede faktisk et konsulentfirma, fordi vi kunne ikke finde ud af det selv. Så sådan er det nogle gange, skal man have andre til at se på en udefra. Se, vi kom ned i det her, som er en sådan en... en, en en essens, kan man sige. Hvad er det egentlig, der er rødderne her? Ikke? Altså den demokratiske og humanistiske tilgang, den hørte jeg også, jeg ikke fortælle om. Det lyttende og inkluderende proces, det er også det her med, at man går ind i, i dialog med det lokale. Man er professionel projektpartner. Og det er faktisk noget, som vi i hvert fald som danske arkitektvirksomheder bliver mødt med ude i udlandet, det er, at vi er faktisk ret gode til at få tingene til at ske. Det er fordi, vi kigger over en hel palette, der er mange andre steder, hvor du kommer ned i mere regulerede lande. Nu skal jeg ikke nævne et stort land, der ligger syd for os, men Tyskland kommer jeg til at gøre det alligevel. De arbejder jo efter nogle helt andre strukturer og har nogle faggrænser, som ligger så meget, meget, meget præcist. Der kan være gode ting ved det, der kan være dårlige ting ved det. Det dårlige er, at hvis noget går galt, så står det stille. Så pludselig stopper det bare. Og det har vi fået ord for, at den danske arkitektvirksomhed, vi tager sådan set hele paletten. Og det kan I også gøre, hvis I vil. Jeg ved, nogle af jer gør det garanteret også alligevel. Men det er det, som kendetegner ved, at man sådan set ikke springer over, hvor gade laver, men siger, at vi skal fag med løse det her. Vi vil have den ud over rampen. Det skal vi gøre. Så, så det er noget, der ligger i den her, og så selvfølgelig med rødderne i det danske samfund. Vi repræsenterer jo nogle af verdens, eller jordklodens ældste samfund, også i Norden. Og det, det, der har vi altså noget kultur, vi har simpelthen noget solidt at stå på, som er interessant at tage videre. Det blev noget af det her. Og så begyndte vi at lave det, der hedder en brandplatform. 
sammen med nogen, der havde Friday. Og så kigger man lidt på den. Det, det er en indkredsning. Altså, kan, I, kan I godt læse dansk også? Det kan I sagtens. Ikke? Det minder jo en rimelig meget om, om den norske. Så vi kiggede lidt på det, hvor vi kiggede på Danmark som showcase, og vi kunne også godt have taget øh, Norden som showcase. Vi kiggede, og så zoomer man det ind til kernen. Og kernen, det er så der, hvor vi kigger på de to midterste spørgsmålstegn. Hvad er essensen? Kan man finde en essens? De af jer, som var med øh, ude på den norske ambassade i København, I, øh, der mødte I også en fra Mensch, som havde lavet den her Nordic. Hvad, hvad, hvad er det for en historie? Fantastisk historie. Altså, den, den fagnede hele Norden, så at sige. Ikke? Og vi prøver at tage den skridt videre og kigge på den på arkitekturen. Hvad medfører den egentlig? Hvad ender den med? Kan man finde et eller andet, som er interessant at kigge på? Så der var mange diskussioner omkring med den, fordi det er jo den, der den kan skille vandene, men den kan også være noget, der kan samle. Så vi brugte meget tid på at have forskellige tilgange til det. Det kunne være alt fra customized Nordicness, people architecture, built for people, bespoke Nordicness, happy architecture. Og så havde vi democracy og people, holistic og alt muligt andet, så creating happiness osv. osv. Vi kom frem til en, som vi arbejder med nu, og den er en, som den kan godt skille vandene lidt. Og den, vi diskuterede den i bestyrelsen, vi diskuterede den alle mulige steder, og den kom til at se sådan her ud. Så siger man, den, man smiler lidt, og samtidig tænker man, er det nu også, altså, er det ikke lidt for let? Er lidt forsøgt, og så kommer man til at tænke på uh, Pharrell Williams, der har den der sang der med Happy, som I måske kender. Uh, og der var andre tilgange til det, men, men, men tanken var bare i den her, at den, den rissede, altså den, den gjorde skade, men den gjorde også opmærksom. Så man sagde, okay, hvis man nu havde skrevet, at vi skal bare have noget med, hvad, kan vi ikke bare tage human architecture eller et eller andet, der minder om det, så ville det bare ikke gøre nogen forskel, fordi som I også hørte, Jack fortæller især, at kommunikationsmængden, der er ude, den er gigantisk. Så hvis du bare skal have en fli af mulighed for at få en lille bitte smule, nogen der lige stopper op og tænker, hvad betyder det? Altså det, er, det findes rent faktisk, arkitekten. Og så altså, happiness er jo sådan set, man kunne godt kalde det nordisk. Og det refererer jo selvfølgelig til, at vi, Norge, Sverige og Danmark, er de tre lande, som gang på gang bliver kåret som verdens mest lykkelige samfund. Det, vi, det skifter lidt. Nogle gange er vi nummer et, og lige i øjeblikket er det sådan, Norge, der er verdens mest lykkelige. I ser også meget lykkelige ud. Ja. Og nogle gange, svenskerne har vist ikke rigtig fået i førstepladsen, har de det? Nej, jeg, 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 tror, jeg, jeg tror kun, det er Norge og Sverige, der kæmper. Så I kan godt smile her selv. Nå, tilbage til, at, at det er sådan set det, den kom ud af. Fordi, og det er det, vi er kendt for ude i verden. For man skal ikke ret langt syd for den danske grænse eller syd for Hamburg, så er Danmark, det er måske øh, ah, det passer ikke, men jo, Danmark kan være hovedstaden i Sverige eller folk er faktisk ikke de, de kender, de kan ikke rigtig differentiere. Og man kan sige øh, Stockholm har så valgt at være the capital of Scandinavian. Det har I godt set, ikke? Ja, de kan, sådan brander de sig. Og fred være med det, fordi vi har mange fælles ting. Vi har mange fælles træk. Så vi valgte at sige, at den kunne vi køre videre, men ikke alene selvfølgelig. Den skal bygges op rundt om noget. Og så har vi forsøgt at lave det til The Excellent Danish Design, Human Scale Architecture, Process Professionals og More Than Buildings. Og den måde, vi tænker, det kunne blive foldet ud. Og vi er jo som sagt i gang med det lige nu. Bemærk, at der er meget, meget lidt øh, arkitektur over det her. Det er sådan en rigtig PowerPoint-ting. Øh, der kommer ganske få bedre. Uh, og, det, og det kommer der for en årsag, fordi øvelsen går ud på noget helt særligt, som jeg også uh, vil slutte af med. Den her, det kunne være en, det kunne udfolde sig på den her måde. Architecting happiness. Altså, hvad er vi for en størrelse? Har I set den der? Ved I, hvad det her er? Ja. Den, den stort set, alle steder i verden har man set den der skide cykelbro. En cykelbro i København, som tog år og dag at få igennem, men altså til sidst så kom den så, og så blev den der, og så er den der. Den har flyttet afsindig mange broer for Dissing og Weitling, som er dem, der har lavet den, i udlandet. Så der er i, i Kina, der har bygget de så en, det her det tog fem år, det tog fem måneder at lave den ude i Kina, og der er den i tre etager. Så, så det er helt vildt, hvad, hvad de kan derude, på godt og ondt. Det kunne også se sådan her ud. Det her det er jo meget æstetisk. Det er excellent Danish design. 
Det er Vadehavscenteret. Det er en, der hedder Dorte Mandrup, der har lavet det. Det er også når man kunne kigge ud fra. Eller det her Modern Buildings. Eller det her Human Scale Architecture. Det er faktisk et, hedder det kollegium på, har I det ord på norsk også? Der, hvor der studerende bor. De bor i sådan noget som det der. Det er ikke kedeligt at bo i. Og det ligger i et ret dyrt område i København. Der er lækkert. Så, og så er der forskellige historier knyttet til det. Men, men den vigtige pointe, pointe i det her, ja, det er selvfølgelig noget om historikken, det er, hvordan vi fungerer. Så, så det her, hvad er det for noget? Det her, det er sådan set de her ambassadører. Så gik vi i gang med dem, da vi havde lavet det her, så kaldte vi dem ind igen, og så sagde vi til dem, hvad kunne I tænke jer at bruge af materiale, når nu I skal ud og holde møder? Eller, og det var alt fra, vi har, øh, i, øh, jeg tror, State of Green, og har I hørt om, har I noget tilsvarende? Det er nogen, der samler den, altså den, det grønne øh, i ens land. Altså State of Green er nogen, der samler alle de virksomheder, som arbejder med grønne løsninger i Danmark. Måske har I noget tilsvarende. Nej, men det kan godt et underbyggeri. Sådan. Der var en masse forskellige, som jo taler med mange, mange mennesker rundt omkring. Dem vil vi gerne have til at fortælle. Hvad synes I, I kan tage med under armen? Skulle det være et stort, dyrt magasin? Det havde vi faktisk lavet til dem. Men det ville de ikke have. Det var, det, nej, nej, de ville have powerpoints, Slides dokumenteret med cases. Og casene skulle faktisk være bygget rundt og op omkring noget, der er en bruger har udtalt, at vi gør sådan og sådan og sådan. Og så er vi tilbage til den der value creation. Sidst talte vi lidt om, hvad er det egentlig, I leverer? Jamen, I leverer faktisk værdi. Jeres værdi ligger ude i meget, meget, den første del af processen. Det er jo der, hvor den største værdi faktisk bliver skabt. Den historie har I sikkert hørt nogen sige, ikke? Men det er ikke det, I får penge for, desværre. Men det kunne man jo godt tænke sig, at der var en lidt tydeligere sammenhæng mellem det, I faktisk skaber og det, man ser. Så hvis en bruger siger i et, øh, et byggeri, et, hvad enten det er en industribyggeri, eller om det er et boligkarré, fortæller om, at vi har fået så meget bedre livskvalitet, eller vi har fået et fald i sygefraværet, eller vi har øh, sørget for, at vores produktivitet er vokset, hvad end det måtte være ude fra Brundtlands øh, sociale eller altså bæredygtighedsdimensioner. Det er faktisk dem, vi bruger til. Og så kan man sige, at det er jo helt tilbage fra, hvornår lavede hun det i 1987, tror jeg. Altså den sociale, det miljømæssige og økonomiske bæredygtighed. Det er standarden, man stadigvæk bruger for at måle, om noget giver værdi. Bæredygtighed, men nu er det så trukket ind i alt muligt andet. Så den historie, det, den vil de gerne have, at man kobler det med nogle konkrete cases. Og hvis det skulle være film, så skal det være længden film. To minutter max. Ligesom World Economic Forum, hvis I har I set dem? Ja, de laver sådan nogle små korte. De behøver ikke være særlig fancy, men de fortæller altid en historie. Så står der et eller andet tal og blinker, eller en eller anden dokumenteret effekt. Og det er sådan set, hvad de her ambassadører gerne vil have. Kunsten i det her, den har simpelthen været øh, den her øvelse her. Den her øvelse, den har været meget, meget angstprovokerende for vores øh, medlemmer, fordi det, der i virkeligheden var historien, det var, at vi skulle have non-arkitekter, altså ikke-arkitekter, til at tale med ikke-arkitekter, om arkitekter. Fordi det er jo ikke en arkitekt, der køber jeres ydelse. Vel? Ofte er det heller ikke nødvendigvis, ja, i Jacks tilfælde måske er det en arkitekt, der kan sælge. Han er så ikke selv arkitekt, men der sælger til en eller anden developer. Men hvis I kan få andre til at fortælle, hvorfor I er gode, det vil, så skal I gøre det i et sprog, som ikke er arkitektet. Så kun, men alligevel skal det fremstå, som om det er noget, en arkitekt har lavet. Det er altså en hardcore balance at skulle finde den vej. Men vi tror på, at det er det, der skal til. Så det har været meget, 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 meget øh, angstprovokerende for de her arkitekter, fordi, ham kan de nu sige historien rigtigt? Vi tror simpelthen ikke på, at de kan finde ud af at sige de rigtige ord. Men, men det er det, der er øvelsen, ikke desto mindre, i det her tilfælde. Fordi vi som organisation skal vi ikke gå ud og fortælle, hvad der differentierer 3XN fra Dorte Mandrup. De kommer alle sammen samme sted fra, i en konkurrence, så skal de stå på, altså, så skal de jo fortælle deres historie. Men som organisation skal vi prøve at finde en eller anden form for en platform, og det er det, vi har gjort. Og, og man kan sige tilbage til, at hvorfor er det så, at danskerne gør det lidt bedre end nordmændene? De her 20 procent kontra, eller 25-25, eller kontra jeres 1 procent. Jeg tror, det kommer lidt ud af, du, du startede faktisk med det, Camille, med at vi, altså Knud Hamsen, I har glemt ham lidt, sulten. Men vores var hjulpet kraftigt af, som Jack refererede, i 2009. Der røg der simpelthen hul i det danske marked. Det stoppede fra den ene dag til den anden dag. 
Så var markedet lukket. Og jeg fortælle bare på sådan på nettoresultat, altså at sige, hvad man tjente, så tjente man i 2009 40 millioner, altså 40 millioner, eller hedder det, hvad hedder det 40, eller hvad hedder det egentlig på norsk? 40. 40. 40 millioner danske kroner i 2017 var det tal 400 millioner. Så man kan sige, at det har virkelig været skidt i 2009. Så alle var tvunget til at søge andre steder hen. Så det er sådan en ting, der er anderledes. Den anden ting, og den diskuterede vi også lidt sidst, det var, at Danmark har jo ikke rigtig nogen naturressourcer, så vi har ikke noget, vi sådan kan læne os tilbage og sige, der er, der er noget med, at I har lidt olie. Er der ikke noget med? Ja. Og lidt andet godt. I har også en storhed i jeres natur. I har nogle ting, som vi som danskere ikke har. Så vi har jo været tvunget til at være handelsfolk. Jeg tror, det er det, der lidt er en lille... Det ligger, det ligger kulturelt også i os. Den lille forskel. Vi er lidt mere open-minded. Øh, altså på, på godt og ondt, ikke? Altså på godt og ondt. Så, så fordi det er, ikke, og det er ikke altid lige godt. Så man skal, gøre, man skal, man skal passe på en gang imellem. Ikke? Men, men jeg tror, det er i hvert fald nogle af de ting, der gør, at, at vi har gjort det. Så i dag har det altså været, også været meget angstprovokerende for mig at holde det her, fordi jeg har, ikke, jeg har ikke vist et eneste tal. Og det gjorde jeg sidst, men det, jeg synes ikke, der var nogen tal at fortælle sådan rigtigt her. Det vigtige, det var at prøve at kigge på, kan man finde en positionering, som kan gøre, at medlemskredsen inde hos os, kan stå lidt på ryggen af en historie. Så det er ikke sådan, så, så, så man slipper for det arbejde, som Jack laver ud af sig, eller andre gør, men måske er vi med til sådan at åbne nogle døre, bane nogle veje, og sørge for, at de folk, som i forvejen er ude og sælge Danmark, de så også lige har historien med om, du burde faktisk overveje at tale med en dansk arkitektvirksomhed. Og så kan det godt være, at de ikke kan kende forskel på en dansk og en norsk. Det gør ikke så meget. Vi sælger det nordiske. Og man kan sige, at det er sådan set øh, slutningen på det, jeg vil for, øh, fortælle. På den lige den her. Okay? Det der, altså, jeg havde egentlig tænkt, vi skulle starte med, men det der, det er jo vikingerne. Ikke? Hvem er de rigtige vikinger? Er de danskere, eller er de nordmænd, eller er de svenskere? De er ikke så meget svenskere, vel? De er mere nordmænd eller danskere. Jeg, jeg tror det. Ja, ja. Altså, der er lige sned sådan nogle finder med. Jeg ved ikke, hvordan de lige kom med det op, men... Men i hvert fald, vi skal jo ud af Europa verden, og så er der bare én ting, som også er utrolig vigtig at sige. Du nævnte det faktisk lidt, Jack. Det er, når man tager ud på markederne, så ved jeg godt, at på et tidspunkt er der nogen, der har siddet og tænkt fra norsk side. Vi taler lidt med arkitektbedrifterne, og så sagde de så på et tidspunkt, at vi havde travlt, så vi gav danskerne en lillefinger. Kender I det udsprog, hvis man giver dem lillefingeren? Og så trak de hele armen af. Så altså det her med, at, at der er nogle gange, skal man være opmærksom på, præcis som din sætning i Australien-historien, det skal gå begge veje. Så det handler lige så meget om at lære, som det handler om at tage markedsandele. Fordi sammen løfter vi en global udfordring ved at lære af hinanden, og det var også lidt Camilles øh, hvad skal vi sige, læringspunkt, at man skal, altså for, for at kunne blive stor i sit eget land, skal man ud og være global, og for at være global, behøver man nogle andre kompetencer end dem, man har i dag. Så vores tilgang er sådan set, at vi vil prøve at se, om vi kan finde den her vej her, hvor vi hjælper vores arkitektvirksomheder til at komme videre. Og jeg tror ikke, jeg har mere at fortælle om det, så det er ikke sådan, der er ikke nogen quick fix løsning, men vi prøver at se, om vi kan folde det her ud og lave til noget, hvor vi kan stå på ryggen af en god historie for alle medlemmerne. Tak for det. Uh, thank you very much, Lars Emil, and uh, those of you joining the uh, Scandinavian language uh, seminar this afternoon will also have uh, the chance to hear more about the numbers and um, other tips. Um, looking at the uh, Vikings, I think of two things from uh, the uh, talks this morning. First of all, credibility. I mean, these guys don't have a credibility problem, right? Cred credibility is not an issue with them. Uh, <laughs> And somehow credibility is both something that we have, I think, in the glo global marketplace because of the societies and the social models that we represent. Um, but credibility also has to do with uh, something that has been mentioned this morning. Credibility, you don't really think about it that way, but it also has to do with listening. You know, it's not only how you present yourself to the world, but also the ability to absorb 
uh, which I think is, uh, is worth thinking about. And the other thing which I think Carmela um, demonstrated uh, uh, very efficiently, don't be scared. You know, there is no, and don't wait, because it's not going to come. You've got to go out there and grab it. So, the uh, next speaker, bear with me. Nilla, uh, is yours a, p a PowerPoint or a yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's the last one, sorry. Oh, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a spoiler. That's not nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, um, Arup uh, is a company well known to Scandinavian architects. It was founded in London in 1946 by engineer Over Arup, and it now employs more than 14,000 people in uh, more than 34 countries. And we are very privileged um, to welcome here today a speaker who will give us just a little more insight into how to operate around the world without losing sight of some of those core values. Nile Jul Sørensen is an architect with long experience from practice. He was also head of the Danish Design Center for four years, and now he works in Toronto as Arab's principal global business leader for architecture. Nile. Thank you. I think I'll do it in English so you'll understand it. And also, I realize that the first thing you lose is your language, and the last thing is food, right? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> uh, there'll be a few images. So, this is me. Uh, this is where, you know, uh, I spent 150 days outside my home. Um, Heathrow Airport, uh, Pearson Airport, you name the airports, I know them all, they look the same. Um, all the airlines are the same. Uh, the most shitty one is Scandinavian Airlines, because all the points you actually get, you know, you can, you can never spend them, right? So that's why I fly British Airways. Anyway, so uh, in and out of, uh, of London, where Arab's head office is in London, uh, due to Brexit, we're trying to move slowly out, because uh, it's going to be Mad Max. So anyway, so I'm here also because I actually work on Lusaka Station, uh, a competition we won together with... Uh, Asplan Vieg and Longva Architects. And it's really fantastic. Uh, coming to Norway is so relaxing. People are so nice, <laughs> so kind. In Canada, when you sign a contract, two minutes after you sign, the first uh, thing goes in for a court case. <laughs> Immediately, you're behind. So here it's all about let's meet and have coffee. Um, you know. <laughs> wow. So it's sort of coming on holiday. <clears throat> Uh, so this is where we work, so it's a different situation than you have, in a way, but in another way, because we are setting up architecture around the world. Um, so uh, right now we're 250 architects in Arab uh, who are doing architecture. We're about 600 architects who are doing something else. Uh, but the whole idea is that we want to do more arch architecture, and the reason for that is that our tagline, we shape a better world. Uh, so it's not maybe to do buildings, but to do outcomes. And architects are really focused on outputs, and we think where everything is going is for outcomes. So the architecture you know, can be done by 3XN, by everybody else, but we would like to do how to plan the outcomes of what we do, because it's all linked in to technology, sustainable, SDGs, and all these things, how to see the work. So, um, so I start up companies constantly. Um, basically, uh, it's easier for me because I have an address most of the time when I arrive. But um, in Arab, uh, the battle is not externally to get jobs. It's internally. Because we have all our big clients, our architects. So we have to tiptoe around. So if we work with 3EXN, you know, I cannot take a job that could have gone to 3EXN. So there's a, the whole politics about that is... Uh, a lot harder than actually getting a job for a client outside. <clears throat> so why work international? And I realized in Norway, you know, nah, why should we do that? You know, we have an office of 10 people, you know, we have, you know, lunch together, and then we have maternity leave and, you know, <laughs> seven weeks holidays and tax. You know, that, you know, so why should we do it? Exactly. That's, that's the time you have to do it, right? Because now you have the finances, you know, you're fit for it. So do it, because one day the boomerang comes, and it will come. And it just chops your head off, right? 
because people will come in here or the market will just drop because things change, right? And if you are a 10 man band, it's really difficult to navigate because you cannot get the jobs you really want to do if you are bigger. So that's also about collaboration, but you know, why work international? I also think it's really funny because you learn things that you're brought up with that has no value. <laughs> so when I came to London, I got all these plans and all the flats, I changed the door, all the doors uh, opened the wrong way. <laughs> so they came back and said, what the hell are you doing? And I said, well, you open the door so you walk towards the light. I said, no, no, you open the other way because you have a, you have a butler who opens the door and sticks in the tea so you don't see the butler. That's why doors are opening in a different way in England. So there's all these things that's actually quite good fun culturally. So who are you? When you go out, find out who the hell are you. And don't bullshit yourself. Be very honest. And maybe ask someone who's not from, not an architect, but who knows you personally, who can say, bullshit. Now find out who you are, what is it, why, why should I engage with a Nordic architect? I can tell you 50, 100,000 things why I would do that rather than someone else. And you have to find these values. What are the values you want to come? What do you want to achieve? Is it just going for the next holiday? Fair enough, stay home, you know, just be safe. But if you actually want to change the world, as, it, as Camilla said, you know, if you really want to push it, if you want to have that pleasure of could say, actually, I tried. I didn't just talk about sustainability. I went out there and did something. Yeah, maybe you do a little bit, bit, bit. But if we all do that, then something happens. And to me, the Nordic way of thinking is high-valued. Because I think all the speakers have talked about these values that we have, and they are unique. And that's the ones I think you should sell. And by the way, you also know about insulation. That is, uh, and cold bridges, and all these things, they are wow, wow, right, you know. That's, uh, <clears throat> and so find out what do the world needs, right? I see a lot of people going to China, right? I want to do something in China. Why the hell do I want to do anything in China? Oh, if it's a charity, go to China, because you will never get the money, right? In China, you don't do the last part of the job, so you do the upfront conceptual design, and then the LTAs take over, and they just run it, and you are lucky if, you are, if they actually do your project. So if you want to be in control, stay out of China, or find an LTA who you really believe in, and you probably own. If not, it will never happen. And what are your values? You, of course, clients like to see nice images, but it's your values. It's all the values about human. You know, the way we treat each other, you know, why the hell can we pay so much tax and everybody is well off? See, in America, they don't get it. We are communists of the worst sort, right? In Canada, it's a little bit easier because they still have a society compared to the US. But it's, and they also pay tax, right? But a lot of people do not get the system we have. But that's the value. It's all about people. And if you have these values, and if you want to do architecture with these values, fine. I think if you want to do something iconic, it's really tough. Then you have to shoot and everything, and you'll probably never always miss. And then have a 36 degree look on yourself. What are we actually good at? Sometimes I ask officers, you know, when we meet them, say, so what are you good at? Are we really good at kindergartens? We're really good at uh, sports stadiums? We're really good at, you know, infrastructure? And I think, holy shit, there are 10 people and they're good at everything, right? No, find out what is that you're actually good at and what is the essence when you do that. So when I sell, I do a lot of stations worldwide. Yes, it's nice that I've done the city ring and the metro here and there and all over the world, but it's talking to clients about how a person moves from home to work and back again and in a transportation system for two and a half minutes or eight minutes. If you can tell that story, because it's the emotional impact on clients, it's not about all the other things. It's emotional. How do you get them there? So know your playing ground. Know who you're going to be to play against and who you're going to collaborate with. And I think Jack, you know, five things, you know, were really clear. If you come out and, you know, and I know 
There's a reason why I left Denmark, right? Because Danes also think they are God's gift to everything, right? <laughs> and even when it really goes down the drain, they still believe it, that everybody else is wrong, right? In KHR, when I was a partner there, we had meetings that started in, and that, this was in the 90s, that we discussed why Denmark actually said yes to the EE union in 72, right? You know, you just thought, <laughs> fuck, what, what is this? You know, get into the new world, right? And it, it's, maybe people are not out there to harass you. They just do things different. Jack and I talked about it, and in, in Canada, you follow the rules. So if that is your site, then it's your site. And if you start designing on someone else's site, you're out of the competition before you ever get in. So you have to find out, you know, how, how is that? When in Denmark, you can sort of use a little bit of the other side, and then you can do some tricks, and everybody's happy, right? So you have to know what is that playing ground out there, and how do you actually manage that? And then there's money, finance, budget. So if you think you can do it with 100,000 Norwegian kroner, no. If that's the cost of a competition, right? Then you finish the competition, no. So it's about making a budget, making a plan. It takes around, I think, two years before. As Jack, you just said it, so it's just take Jack's five-point plan and do it, you know, one by one, tick them off, right? Who is there? Who is my clients? How do I get in contact with them? Because there will always be someone who pulls your pants. And you have to avoid them. You have to know who it is. And actually, in Denmark, the consulate and the ministry are extremely good at helping you. I think you pay them you know, an hourly rate, and it's really worth um, while doing it. And the same in England. We have you know, the British trade, God knows what. They do a lot of things for us. Even we are big, we always have them with us. And the best thing is if you have some royalties with you. That opens doors, right? You know, no matter what you do. So... Make, make that budget and then add a 50%, right? And don't, don't stop. When you start, it's like a sausage. <laughs> you go all the way through because you will not win the day one or the day two or the day three, but maybe you get it, you know, after a year, and maybe that is the cash cow or whatever, or entry into the market. Eh? And gather all the information and data. Architects, you know, are very emotional. So we go out and say, yeah, they need some of my architecture, right? Because all the other things is shit. Maybe they don't need your architecture. Maybe they need something else that you can wrap in your architecture. But get the data. You know, how do they do contracts? How's the fees? I know that a lot of Danish architects have burned their fingers moving into Canada. Because the conceptual design is Canada's almost like 30%. It's very detailed, and if you think it's a few sketches and an image, no. And they scrutinize it, right? And they are not nice. <laughs> International contractors and clients are not nice. <laughs> because they want money, right? So it's a battle. And I think, you know, to make that scope of work, you know, every bloody little thing, who deliver what and why, is essential. Because the friends you think who's your really good friends are not your friends the day the lawyer shows up, right? And invite people in. Be collaborating. Go out there, find friends, find architects you would like to work with. Architects who maybe have an architecture who's not the way you do architecture, but who are interesting in another way. And I think a lot of architects hate other architects, right? When I passed 50, I decided I love all architects. <laughs> I think they're doing fantastic. And I have learned more in the last 10 years than I did in the first 50 years. Because I don't exclude myself for any debate. I think they're fantastic, right? So when I meet Biaga, I say, you're fantastic. When I meet three times, I say, it's really cool. <laughs> right? I don't like all, all the stuff they do, but, you know, I like them. And I like, you know, and, and I, I get things out, you're a lot more positive. When I meet, when we go somewhere, I meet other architects, I meet contractors, and I really love them. Because that's the way they open up, that's the way they connect with you. Oh, yeah, Neely, he's a really bad architect, but he's a nice guy. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'd rather work with a, with a nice guy for 10 years than an asshole who's a really good architect for 10 years, right? <laughs> so that's how they see you. So, you know, oh, he's the guy who plays banjo. Yeah, he's a nice guy, right? <clears throat> and understand the heart and the soft values. Sometimes we think it's all about the heart thing. Oh, this is how we build, this is how we do. But there's a lot of soft values 
There's a lot of things you do in China you don't do in Norway, you know. And don't come in and say, oh, we, we used to do that. This is how we do it. No. Of course we know how to do it. But don't tell them, just do it slowly. And listen, listen to what they actually want. And then you change them, then you talk to them, and slowly you move them in your direction. So many times I hear foreign architects coming in and say, yeah, but you know, in Britain we do it like this, and you're just saying, oh, fuck, you know, all these bricks. Right? <clears throat> it's not working. It's all the soft values. And, and if you want to go into a city, walk and you know, take a week in that city with no meetings, just walk, walk, walk. Go in, listen to people, be a citizen where you are. So if you want to go to Japan and you've never been there, it's pretty tough, right? And I would say, if you go to Japan, you know, stay a year, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> and you're going to make friends and collaborators. This is so important because you are no one. You can be a star in Scandinavia, and they haven't even heard about Scandinavia when you come out there. So you need someone who will actually help you collaborate. And they are all over. And don't, don't shy away from, you know, maybe going to people who, you know, do the same thing as you do, or you want to go in there, or... Find other people, but check it out, you know, and be open. Export young talent. I think Norway's doing that. I realized how many Norwegians who were in London, they were all over, right? Uh, and import young talent. When I see how many, how many foreigners working on uh, Norwegian offices, it's the big ones, you know, the, the two international ones you have, or the three, they have s someone who's not Norwegian. The rest is basically Norwegian. It's the same problem in Denmark. They were all Danes, right? And they were sitting around, you know, saying, yeah, we're really good, right? Oh, and then there's Luigi from Italy, but he don't understand the fucking thing, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and you can see that uh, 3XN turned it upside down. You need to have different kind of people, different kind of color, different kind of face, different kind of everything. That oh, homogeneous club the Nordic countries so have to be broken because it's not, it's, we're not getting there. So I think what you said about how, how do you get this Nordic DNA and then put all the international people in, and if they buy into it, then they actually, they can deliver a completely new values for you. You cannot do that yourself. You have to have people. So in my office in Canada, uh, we came in, and the, the way we did it in Canada was that we wanted to do architecture in Canada, and everybody said, yeah, it's really difficult, you know. So we, and we found out, even that we have an office in Canada, they were not selling architecture, right? So we said, we need to be in Canada. So we took a project from Riyadh and moved it to Canada with five people and say, now we're here. So everybody worked, you know, really hard on the Riyadh job. And you can do that because you don't have to be in Riyadh, you don't have to be in London, it's all, you know, up there in the clouds. And then we spent all the time going out, talking to people because we were there. So they thought, oh, oh, have you set up an office here? Yeah, 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 we're here, you know, all day, you know, business cards with an address. Okay, now you're one of us. Yeah, yeah, well, we're one of you, right? <laughs> and two years after, we are 25 and we are 10 people short. We can't get enough people. So it's about being there. It's about, you know, being known. And it's about the young talent. And my team on 25 is 19 different nationalities. So I once said, okay, who's Canadian here? And there was one guy who said, <laughs> my parents are Canadian, I'm born here. And I said, okay. So, you know, the next half was, you know, their parents were not from Canada, but they were born in Canada. And the rest of us were from somewhere else, right? And the good thing about, you know, if you actually find these pockets where they don't care where you're from. So you have to find these cities, right? Why is it that I think it's five or six architects, Danish architects who are now working in, in Toronto or in Canada? Because they don't care where you come from. They like Scandinavian design, and they know they can actually build, which is quite cool. And they know there's something called summer and winter. You know, insulation, you know, thermal breaks, all these things that Canadians sort of are getting to, right? So import the young talent. You have the Erasmus. Just take them in. You know, take, if you need one, take five. <laughs> because what happens is that now you know someone in Portugal, now you know someone in Romania, you know someone who speaks the language, someone where you can actually ask them, why do you do these things, right? 
So, and if you're really good at doing kindergartens, it's really difficult to do a kindergarten even in England, right? Because, you know, the way they, they do kids are completely different, right? So, but if you have an English person who can actually tell you what a kindergarten is, then you can say, oh, yeah, well, we don't want to touch that. Or whatever you do, but, you know, get, make friends. And you, if you have them as young people and they're good, they will set up wherever they come back an office, and then you have a collaborator who understands the both things. <clears throat> and this architect is achieved by insights, culture, debates, trust, and individuals. So have mixed teams <clears throat> also in your office. You know, you have to be able to go in, and there have to be one from all you know, European nations or whatever they're from, right? I think it's weird when I see people who are working somewhere in the world and there's no one in the office who comes from there. Then you totally rely on your engineers or someone else. And the last thing, see you. <laughs> I would really like to work, you know, an Arab would like to work with Norwegian architects all over the world because we would like to work here because we like the seven weeks holiday and all these things. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's not a problem getting people into Oslo <laughs> or anywhere, right? But we would like to work with you. Because you have, if you can define that value, then we don't care whether you are a six-people band or a 60-people band. And right now, you know, we talked to Martin, we're just doing a competition in Montreal uh, where the client said, we want something Nordic. And we said, yeah, why don't we call Nordic, right? And it's the first one when you Google Nordic architecture, they come up and say, yeah, we go with those guys. <laughs> so that's how it works, you know. <laughs> and just... Uh, Kiss and embrace, you know, it's a fantastic world out there. It, you're going to be enlightening people, and you're going to be enlightened, and maybe you will leave Norway, and then you'll come back and you say, nah, I want to stay outside because it's actually more fun. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat>
We've had one study trip to Denmark, seen Danish companies and talked to them about their experiences. We had one study trip um, to the World Architecture Festival where uh, five out of our seven members were chosen to present. So that was our international arena. arena. And we had three um, uh, meetings for the whole of the, uh, the open meetings for everybody in the profession. One was about, and they've actually been pretty well uh, visited. One was about uh, marketing or um, uh, Mike is phoning my head today, um, branding for architecture offices. Uh, which is not something that is usually talked about. The other one was about selling the Nordic, about being part of a larger Nordic context, which all of you have uh, mentioned today. And then this is the um, uh, final event. So the only people who can tell you whether or not this has worked, whether or not this has had an effect for the people who've taken part is, of course, the um, uh, architectural practices themselves. And first out is uh, Tormod Avensen from uh, Biotop Architecture in Varda. Varsågod. Hi. Uh, there, I mean, that was the last one. Right, thank you. Okay, I'll just continue in English, I guess. Um, okay, so, um, well, I'm Tormod. I'm, uh, I run Biotope. We're a Fairly small architectural practice. We're six people. Uh, we're based, well, we're based there in Varda. And um, I'll just take these 10 minutes to, like, fairly quickly just run you through uh, what Biotop is and what we've done through this, uh, this uh, program. Okay? This, is, this little design I actually made back in 2009 um, when we, I was finished architecture school in, uh, in Bergen in 2008. And I was really confused as an architect, or I was confused with architecture and the whole architecture scene, because I really didn't find any role models to look at that worked with um, nature, uh, ecology, and sustainability in, in a more meaningful sense outside of uh, architects working with the CO2 emissions of a building project. I felt that like the ecological concept of architecture was missing, and how we spoke with, about nature, how we worked with nature, I missed all of those things. So I decided I have to do something, um, well, I guess a little bit out of the ordinary. So I decided I want to be an architect that works exclusively in, with nature. And to be that, I should move to Varda. Uh, so, any one of you guys been to Varda? <laughs> I know there's a few here who's been there. And uh, it's a spectacularly cool place, uh, literally, as well. Uh, there's 2,000 2, people living there. It's a small fishing village, furthest northeast of Norway. Um, we moved there to basically uh, start an architecture company that works with small-scale architecture that aims to connect people with nature. That's what we do, and that's, what we're, that's the only thing we're going to do. And that, that is kind of what I've been doing, not as an architect, but it's what I've been doing since I was uh, almost a little kid. I've just been traveling and being outdoors in nature. So being outdoors and being into nature, that's my, uh, that's my upbringing. That's what I've been into all my life, the Norwegian friluftsliv concept. I may be taking it a little bit too far, or rather far. I've been super into birding, like all kinds of nature, not just outdoor life, but also like very specifically into birds, nature, plants, like all kinds of wildlife. And this is uh, some drawings I, I made back in when I was 13, 14, something like that, where I had the goal of identifying each and every species in all of Europe and understanding how you can uh, distinguish males from adults, from females, from like... For every single species. I mean, as a 14, 15 year old, I would know all the Latin names of all the bird species in Europe, which is over the top nerdy, probably. <laughs> uh, and that takes you somehow takes you to Varda. In 2009, Varda was actually ranked as the, as the worst town in Norway to move to. Uh, officially ranked as the 430th community in Norway. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't go there, basically, is what it says. Um, I, I decided it's a fantastic place because I really didn't care much about the architecture. I didn't look at the architecture. I just looked at the natural qualities of the place. And I thought it had an amazing abundance of wildlife and exclusive, unique nature. And I wanted to somehow be a part of sharing that with the world. So the first design I did was kind of very fitting with the whole Architecture Go Global program because it was the intention from the very beginning was to move to this small place and discover something of... Uh, of a unique value that I was certain had 
and international potential. And I knew as a birder, this would have a potential to reach a big international audience. Because if you look at an international audience of nature enthusiasts, nature photographers, bird watchers, and such, there are, for example, there are millions of bird watchers around the world that people are spe very specifically interested in nature. And I thought, if I can take this place, promote that to an international audience, that would be a business model for us as architects. And it would be a business model for the community we moved to. And somehow, if we made that story work, it would be a way for us to become international as well. This is the front page of the guidebook that we've done. I mean, as an architecture company, we do quite a lot more than just being an architect for buildings. We made this guidebook. It's sold now in 4,000 plus copies to more than 50 countries. Uh, we're, we're making bird festivals. We're inviting artists. We're, we're doing science workshops. We're doing all kinds of uh, people-related projects because, I mean, in the end, architecture is about people. And as architects, I guess, people, a lot of people think we're... We're just architects for little buildings. I think we're architects for destinations. And that's the concept we're, we're taking further a lot of places now. So we're designing these, um, I guess, small pieces of architecture aiming to connect people with nature. And I think it fits very well with the whole Nordic concept of being in the outdoors, understanding nature, having a recreational re relationship with nature. But we've also connected a lot with an international bird watching audience, nature conservation audience, like uh, nature photographer audience. I spent basically the past 10 years not talking with any architects. So apologies for that in a way. But I've kind of been deep, yeah, I've been deep diving for 10 years into meeting scientists, ecologists, nature photographers, like all these uh, people from the niche that we're actually serving and, and, and which I'm also a part of myself. So I brought the whole architecture toolbox into the scene. That's what we were doing. And realizing how much you learn from that is also important because being uh, uh, like the Norwegian or Nordic way of understanding nature is hugely valuable, but it's a recreational understanding of, of nature. So we go to UK and then we get the naturalist understanding of nature, like all the way from Charles Darwin to David Attenborough almost. It's a, it's a very different way of understanding nature. And in a way, I feel like I'm trying to bridge these and that's what we've been doing now for the past few years. So it's not only about putting up uh, a little wind shelter next to a spectacular bird cliff, which is the bird cliff in, in, in Varda. It's also, I'll just show you a few, a few slides, I'll just run fairly quickly through them. It's, it, it, it very much affects how you design, how you design for wind shelter. It affects how, where you position things. Do you make windows on, in, on this direction, which is what you should, if you make windows in this direction, you're going to kill a lot of birds because you, you need to know the flyways of the birds. So there are all these biological insights. So if you don't have them, you're going to, well, fuck up very quickly. And then it's, in, it's the part of being uh, a part of a community, uh, and which is a kind of the statistics part. It basically says that uh, it was an 80% value growth in the tourism or travel business in Varangar which is the region we belong to from 2010 to 15, which kind of proves the whole point of moving there, kickstarting this whole idea of actually developing a destination based on bird watching and nature photography has a lot of value. And then what happened, we hoped would happen, did happen, like we, we would get a lot of uh, international attention from a nature conservationist and naturalist audience. So this kind of brought our architectural thinking to a more international audience. And, and when this started happening, this Architectural Go, Go Global program also happened. So we were like, when we read that uh, description of the program, we were like, holy shit, this is, like, this is actually spot on. This is like, I couldn't believe it when I read it. It's like, this seemed almost a uh, setup for us. So we applied. Uh, we felt very lucky to be uh, a part of it because we were like one office from Varda, there were six offices from Oslo, and then there was a <laughs> also, also weirdos in Varda. <laughs> so, so we felt very happy about it. But now we're kind of we've been in invited to do a project in quite a lot of places. And if it weren't for the Go Global program, we probably wouldn't have well even the financial capability and time to set aside to visit all of these places and spend a lot of time there and spend a lot of time connecting with people. Uh, all the way from the Tibetan Plateau, where we looked into snow leopard shelters, uh, 
to UK, where they're setting up new nature reserves, and luckily they're deciding to use Biotope as architects because we actually know how to handle wind, we know how to read the landscape, we know how to read the ecology of the space, and we understand our clients. And, and I mean, looking at the UK audience, this is just a few uh, couple of weeks back. So as a part of our program, we traveled around UK many times to give talks at Nature Conservation Organization, uh, to visit, uh, visit nature reserves, and uh, to basically connect with the UK audience. And it's been hugely helpful for us. Uh, so much so that we actually hired this guy, or actually set up the Biotope UK office now in York. So that started uh, January 1st, actually, this year. We were registered as a UK office as well. And uh, that's from our UK website. And we're, we're basically going to take the whole Norwegian idea of freeluftsliv and diversified, like niche thinking of nature, like mountain climbing, kayak paddling, bird watching, nature photography, all of these niches of nature interests is what we're going to make global. Uh, we're also doing projects in Iceland. Uh, same thinking, these are three other projects that were initiated um, through this program, and they're just built in position. Uh, as well, here's the team. There's a lot of changes happening at the office now because we're scaling down in Varde, as I realized. Um, um, I guess in, in a way I've been become well. When you're the kind of the engine of the of the office, in a way, you also have to decide like how long are you going to stay with your first <laughs> love in a way, which is which is Varde. So we're still keeping an office in Varde, but in a way we're also scaling down in Varde now in order to scale up in UK and also to start our Nordic office, which is going to be somewhere placed, either Copenhagen, Sweden, Oslo, somewhere. We don't know. We're looking for partners, actually. So that's our kind of very short, brief story of Biotope and the Go Global program. I guess that was 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Tor Maud. Um, next up. We have uh, Haugen Sohar Architects. Yeah. Marit Haugen and Dan Sohar, who have looked at a very different uh, part of the world. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, is yours PowerPoint or a PDF? Do you remember? This is PowerPoint. Den, den, exakt. Nej, det är Arlen. Där. <laughs> Free diving? <laughs> okay. Okay, my name is uh, Marit. I'm co founder of Haugen Zohar Architecture in Oslo. We are a tiny little squad sitting just 500 meters upside the river here. And uh, one and a half year ago, my partner asked me, Why do you think we should export Norwegian architecture? And at that time, the answer for me was not very clear, but it is clearer now. I think we should export Nordic architecture because we know the best. Thank you, Carmela. <laughs> and we know the best, uh, okay, one of the best, because we have very harsh climate up here. We have exquisite topography and we have brilliant reference project to look at, and we have a will to make a change in the sustainability of our future. Um, and besides, we share uh, all our 25 million people in the Nordic countries, we share the same social value, which is um, distinguished, beautiful. We are a tiny little, uh, maybe the smallest architecture firm in the world. Uh, me and Turmud Tur and us. Uh, but nevertheless, we have a great, great variety of projects from all scale. From the tiniest little arch sculpture project to city plan, uh, transformation, uh, of buildings, uh, new buildings with CLT and uh, a variety both in typology but also in the matter of knowing material. All the little projects that we have ever dealt with uh, that are small in size, 
size we built by our own hand. This gave us some insight in production strategies. How do we produce the things that we are drawing in the office? How do we connect with the sagbruk, with the forester, with the uh, producer, manufacturer? How does this workflow go? So, from the very tiny little art sculpture, we gain a specter of know-how uh, and deep diving into parametric design values. And not that I'm a so big fan of parametric design and blah, 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 but I'm very much fond of the opportunity that this flowless, um, <laughs> seamless, uh, um, seamless, seamless um, processes between the architectural practice and the, uh, uh, this, the, the end product and the workflow between that. This gave us a lot of interesting in CLT, cross-laminated timber construction, and how do we relate this insight into making bigger construction and how we put um, our knowledge into um, emphasize and facilitate those uh, processes for making a better life for our client. Because daily we meet clients that come to us and say, listen, people, we want a house from Silti. We want a very, very sustainable house. Give it to us. And we said, we can draw it to you. We can plan it to you. But we cannot build it to you. And then we need to call people that produces and deliver the wood. And then we need to drag the, the um, consultant team in order to... But they don't have time because the client, they need things that they, they can't get them. So we still have this uh, not so fluently and, and uh, um, some, some less seamless. Se seamless flow of construction site yet. Uh, this project gave us a lot, um, and as I said about the know-how, we know how to work in Norway with the climate. We are super good in adjusting our uh, skills in technologies and uh, regarding the regulation, how to build in harsh climate. We want to, ta to take this knowledge and to implement it in another world, in another site in another country that we love because we are half from Israel. My partner is Israeli and my mother is from Israel, so I grew up there. And we wanted to see how can we, uh, how can we tell Israelis building sites, maybe you should work with wood. And listen, Israeli building sites, it's only about concrete. Wood is a no-go. So for us, it was like, <laughs> okay, how, how, how should we do this? And is it even impossible? Um, and it was impossible because of you, because of Architecture to uh, Go Global. It gave us some quietness, some, um, you know, some order, some, some, some economical power to go to Israel, to take some break and to think, how are we going to implement our know-how in sustainable a prefabricated housing system into another country. Uh, and of course, we had a little bit little squad, but still, I'm the only Norwegian in the firm, and uh, probably the one who writes Norwegian without any mistakes. Uh, so, of course, we should do this. Of course, we should connect to the world, and also I tell my colleagues to to encourage them to think, how can we implement know-how in Czechia or in Italy or in, uh, not in Sweden maybe, but in Iceland indeed. Okay, so our focus in, din, in this architecture uh, go global program were divided into three. First, we wanted to introduce cross-laminated timber in warm climate. We don't know that yet. So we looked into Italy, we know, looked into Spain, how some case study there and gained some know-how. And then we fight for a pilot project in Israel. Number two was demystifying wooden construction in Israel. And it was very, very hard. Nobody would like to 
building a building material you never heard before, or you just, you know, good Norway, Norway, Nordic country, but not in the Middle East, but Sydney does it, uh, Northern Italy, uh, Southern Italy does it, Span Spain does it, why not Israel, why not the Middle East? The Middle East is hush on area, they don't have anywhere to expand, they need to go high rise and they need to go fast. So this construction is brilliant for them. The third point was to pushing the boundaries of wood technology and improving the workflow across the building chain. We did that, we put up a strategy, basically uh, divided to two. One was to seek for a scope uh, and, uh, and a network. The other one was, um, sorry, the one was to get contracts uh, within the already project that we won there. See you soon in Tel Aviv. It was a big competition that we won two years ago about the coastal park in Tel Aviv. Beautiful project, very high ambition uh, in sustainable matters. And uh, we thought also maybe to compete uh, with other projects in order to implement wood construction to, to those projects. And then we thought about scope project in which typology in student housing and in, in uh, um, industrial halls and so on. Um, and then we looked up preliminary contacts and potential collaborators, potential clients, useful organizations who can give us knowledge, uh, certification of uh, CLT in Israel and of course embassy in PR media. And along the way we did uh, um, check where are we, what did we gain, what did we manage and why not. We did some uh, teaching, uh, we did a lot of seminars, we did a lot of uh, visiting to academies, which is very, very important for us. We did, uh, had a good connection with the Green uh, Building uh, Alliance, Green Buildings, uh, Big Alliance in Israel. So my Britain sister, they've been a sister um, group for the Norwegian one now, and they're actually now uh, with them at the Dijkmanske, visiting Norway these days. Um, and of course, we try to, we are not so good at it, we try to be um, visible in the media and the television, would, not would, uh, it was uh, a lot of discussion, interesting ones, and of course, we took Israelis here, and this was very fruitful because they, uh, they met Snoeta, they made uh, mad and dark and big offices, and we kind of saw that uh, everybody wants to meet other professionals from the world, and and look how and know how and, and meet also building authorities and so on. So now we have regularly once a year, we have a group of 35, 40 people coming to Israel, uh, decision makers from Israeli governments, from um, uh, uh, city architects and city... Um, and this is maker that this is important for us to learn how do you do implement things in Norway. And this is from Planner Beginning Sataten. Dan took all the squad from Tel Aviv, Planner Beginning Sataten, to Norwegian. And they learned about waste management and water is silent. And it was beautiful. We are sharing knowledge. And, and I mean, politics, no politics. We met <laughs> in the middle, <laughs> around the table. It was fun. Um, yeah. A lot of that. And then what happened? We searched for a pilot project and, and that was not hard because we got some um, uh, no, <laughs> not support. <laughs> we got an uh, inquiry from those people, from the settlers, come and build in the West Bank. We need houses tonight. We need to expand tonight. Silty seems as a big sol great solution for us. We didn't want to do that. We didn't want to. So this was a very frightened uh, uh, direction to go, of course. And the other one who gave us uh, a call was the Israeli IDF, the Israel Defense Force. And then we also, what is happening here? Shall we, one day settlers, the other one Israel Defense Force. And I said, okay, Innovation Norway, what do we do now? Uh, so we say no thank you to the IDF, but then came a very interesting uh, inquiry to us, also through the IDF, 
but it was um, about uh, um, doctors without board borders. Like Miran said, they called us and said, listen, we have a lab on the uh, border between Israel and Syria, helping refugees, Syrian refugees, uh, with med medical treatment. But because of the situation, we need to shut this down and we, de we need to relocate the, um, the, um, the, div the, the structure, the buildings uh, uh, somewhere else. And then, we um, uh, made a cooperation with the Israel Technology Institute of T T Technology, uh, the Technion, and we uh, decided to make a pilot project to relocate this uh, program uh, on the roof of one of the buildings on the in the Technion in the academy. And this was kind of wow, we did it. We, so now actually in Switzerland we're going to build Israel first pilot project in CLT on the top of the roof of one of the academic building for uh, doctors without borders. And this is great for us. Uh, okay, I'm running here. Um, what we opened? Okay. Um, is that so important? Maybe not. <laughs> Uh, woof, 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 woof. Um, okay, this is further, we have further stra uh, strategy. What shall we do with our insight now? And we have a lot of things coming up. We are working in Israel in July with a student in September starting a course uh, with this uh, project and so on. And we are going into collaboration with Venn City in order to look upon CLT construction in Hamburg. This is the... the, the uh, the firm that Carmela talked about. Um, sorry about this. This is awful. Um, uh, have the, the program till for no good work in contact with another institute? Of course. What we couldn't do without this if we hadn't got this program, uh, we uh, shared the risk in a way because we dare to do it. We dare to. Uh, we think that but to bra men yeah my best. Seriously, the reason that you get the 13 uh, um, Sök was because we don't need it. No, it's so good for architects. Plenty of work. Why should we bother? Um, and this is the inside. We love Norway, and here we have a great workflow and so on. But we have gained skills, and we have gained a network, and we are now um, running for maybe our second office in Tel Aviv. Yes. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marit. Uh, one of the great things about the discussions that we've had um, in the program is that we've had uh, uh, both quite large and quite small practices. And now we're going to hear from one of the more established practices, what um, the, we have been able to, um, to uh, gain in experience from them and then from the rest of the program. That's Svein Lund from Lund Hagen Architecture. Sorry guys, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> That's what you should say, talk about amongst yourselves, so you can see everything you're doing. When this thing is done. Mm. Tack. Eh, jag har förberett det på norsk, så jag tror jag tar det på norsk. Eh, vi är er ett arkitektkontor som har vuxit från cirka 20 till 30 till 40 till 50 och nu 60. Eh, og vi har stort sett varit en partner per 10 stycker. Så nu är vi fem partnere, Det ser det till höger här. Och så ser det kontoret till vänster i Berlin på studieturen i år. Eh, jag tror vi fant ut att vi är er 
13, eller 14 nasjoner, hvis du regner Norge som en nasjonalitet, så er vi 14, 14 nasjoner på kontoret, noe som vi har veldig stor glede av, særlig når vi prøver oss ute. Det som jeg synes er, har vært det vanskeligste før vi møtte dere, det var jo at når vi hadde samlinger og styremøter på kontoret, hvorfor skal vi ut av Norge? I Norge så har vi et veldig godt marked. Vi har absolutt nok å gjøre. Vi får flere tilbud enn vi kan svare på. Honorarene i Norge er, så vidt jeg erfarer, hvis vi er heldige og er klare for å gode kontrakter, noe av de beste honorarene vi får i verden. Så det er grunn nummer to for å ikke dra ut. Eh, og vi synes vi får ganske interessante oppgaver i Norge. Men så er det jo slik da i dag med internett, Instagram, etc., at noen av disse tingene vi gjør blir fanget opp ute i verden. Her er det et lite knippe av noen prosjekter som vi har gjort de siste årene. Eh, sånn at vi har egentlig aldri gjort noe i det hele tatt for å komme ut, men vi har blitt kontaktet av... Eh, folk fra hele verden, om å gjøre små og store prosjekter ute. Mest små, dessverre. Det kommer jeg tilbake til. Eh, vi ser til venstre Deikman, som er ferdig om et år. Det kommer jeg litt tilbake til helt på slutten. Og så ser vi noen små hytter, bittesmå, 28 kvadratmeter nedrust til høyre, og andre hytter og hus som har vært eh, blant annet på TV-serier og programmer. Og, og, og det har kanskje vært den Beste reklamen vi har hatt ute i verden, noe det ligger på Netflix, og det er slik folk har kontaktet oss. Så de prosjektene som vi har blitt kontaktet på i de siste årene, eh, og omtrent samtidig sto dette inn, som vi ble med på dette fantastiske programmet. Eh, Thailand går vel ikke så bra, eh, men vi er i forhandlinger hotellprosjekt. Norden Cross skal jeg si litt om, Japan skal jeg si litt om, Sofia driver vi og bygger, ikke bygger, vi tegner, og i Francisco så skal vi tegne et tilbygg til, kanskje til et Frank Lodreit hus. Det er kanskje det mest uh, spennende, men uh, blir kanskje heller ikke noe av. Norden Cross, det er et amerikansk sted som heter Norden Cross, uh, og like bortenfor så heter det Høyfjellet, det er veldig mange nordmenn som har bosatt seg. Dette er tre timer øst for San Francisco. Det er på en måte det stedet folk fra Silicon Valley drar og står på ski. Vi har laget en bebyggelsesplan. Det jeg kan si er at det er utrolig mye regulations. Det er utrolig mye snakk. Jeg vet ikke, det er ikke noen amerikaner her som jeg kan... Altså, man snakker veldig mye, og Skype-samtalene er ikke halv time lange. Dere kjenner det kanskje igjen, de er to timer lange. Og man sier gjerne de samme tingene mange ganger, og det er, det er, det er veldig hyggelig, og det er, det, er, det er et veldig godt samarbeid, men, men det er veldig tungt å jobbe, selv om det ikke finnes språkbarrierer. En av de største problemene vi har der, det er ikke dette. Dette er da den norske bygningstradisjonen som vi har snakket om over der, og sagt at vi har typologier i Norge. Vi har langhuset, vi har løa, vi har ståva og stabbure. Og dette kan vi på en måte nytolke og kanskje bygge i skogene og høyfjellet der borte. Det som er problemet der er at jeg var der nå for en måned siden, og fremdeles nå i midten av april så var det fem meter snø. Tidligere i vinteren så har det vært 30 feet, det er 9 meter. Sånn at de husene vi da eventuelt skulle designe som skal bli brukt om vinteren, de synes jo ikke om vinteren. Og vi er jo vant til å tegne inngangsdøren på første etasjeplan. Og de har prøvd å fortelle meg i to år at du må også ha en inngang i annen etasje. Men heller ikke det hjelper vinter, for du måtte egentlig nesten gå ned gjennom pipen for å komme inn i huset. Og jeg trodde ikke det var sant før jeg var der. Det er det ene problemet. Det andre problemet er at det å bygge i Kalifornia er nesten umulig, sies det nå, på grunn av new fire regulations, etter alle brannene. 
Dette er ikke noe du kan da si at ja, men sånn gjør vi ikke i Norge. Det er et så stort problem at ikke bare skal firetruckene forsere ni meter med snø, de skal da også kunne møte hverandre på veien inn i skogen. Og det som er da det litt rare er at vi er tatt hit fra Norge for vi skal lage våre verdier, og våre verdier er smale veier, ta vare på trærne. Men fakta er at vi må bygge så store veier og hugge så mange trær at våre verdier blir borte. Sånn at eh, hvis dette går videre, vi skal begynne å bygge nå, så er jeg jo tvilsom til at dette kan bli et prosjekt som vi vil bli stolte av på grunn av det at noen av hovedideene våre og hvorfor de kom til Norge kan ikke bli gjennomført. Og så spurte jeg, men what about the environmentalists? Aren't they saying that you shouldn't do that? Og da bare fikk jeg det svaret at brannvesenet, eller også fire regulations, trumfer absolutt alt. I Japan bygger vi kanskje på en tomt. I Japan er dette er et hotell med 50 rom. Eh, ute inne, bygd på hva vi kan fra Norge, men også litt japanske tradisjoner. Her ser vi et rom. Det er noen vanvittig flotte fjell. Det ligger i et sånt onsenområde hvor det er mange naturlige spa. Veldig eh, midt i naturen, med en ekstremt vakker vegetasjon. Og det er da hvordan de har funnet fram til oss, for de har tolket da fra vår hjemmeside, etc., at det er noe vi kan. Det kan jo også helt sikkert japanere. Vi har vært der nede, jeg har vært der tre ganger nå. Og det som vi sliter med i Japan, er ikke så mye brandbiler, men kulturelle forskjeller, som du sa. Jeg har ikke vært der et år, dessverre. Men jeg føler at det å skjønne om de mener de ja eller nei, og, og denne ekstreme på en måte politeness, eller de ser opp til folk som er eldre, så for meg så er det bra. Men, 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 <laughs> men, men det er altså en så store kulturforskjeller at vi har nå problemer med å komme fra sketchproposal til bygging. Fordi nå er det nye, vi hadde en local architect, som vi jobbet godt sammen med en tilrygge heilsegrum råfyr. Men nå er det nye entreprenører, og de vil bruke folk som de kan. Og så møtte vi på en annen liten kulturforskjell, og det var at i Japan så er trehus noe som blir fornyet hvert 25. år. Trehus er på en måte ikke bare i deres øyne. Så de sa, we can build your project, but we do it in steel instead. Så det er der vi er i dag, at det er mulig det blir bygget i stål, av andre arkitekter. Men vi har ikke gitt opp. Her ser vi eh, utdrag av eh, disse byggene. Dette er et lite spanlegg, litt lite, hvor vi da har lagt voldsom vekt på å ta vare på den fantastiske vegetasjonen som er der. Eh, så vi ser frem til at dette kanskje blir bygget. Men vår strategi fremover, for å avslutte, er å ta lærdom av disse tingene i USA, og ta lærdom av tingene i Japan. Og det vil si, jo, vi må kanskje skalere opp satsingen, større prosjekter, og være da mer naturlig enn at vi ser til Deikman som nå er ferdig, og vi har nå en, en branding og et, en plan å gå in i markeder som kanskje hvor kulturforskjellene er mindre. Man tenker da kanskje på Europa. Noen har vært mot Tyskland, men vi har invitert til Tyskland for å se på bibliotek, kanskje. Eh, sånn at eh, jeg tror at disse små oppgavene, veldig langt unna, ikke vil bli prioritert av kontoret. Men det som har vært helt fantastisk til dere, Innovasjon Norge, har vært at det har vært mulig å prøve å få til disse tingene. 
og vi gir ikke opp. Og det hadde aldri vært mulig uten disse midlene. Og den, fordi når jeg kommer tilbake på en tur på styremøtet og sier kan vi nå bevilge 400 000 til til prosjektet i Japan, så er på en måte, nei, vi tjener ikke penger på dette. Kanskje vi skal bruke midlene til noe annet. Men dette har muliggjort at vi kan bruke konsulenter, det har muliggjort å bruke rådgivere. Så uten denne hjelpen hadde vi ikke lært så mye som vi har lært. Det var det. Thank you very much, Svein and Lundhage. Now, it will not have escaped any of you that we are running a bit behind, but uh, you know very well that uh, also that it's all worth it. Um, so there's another coffee break. Um, uh, so grab a coffee. Half of you are going downstairs with me, Nilla, Lars Emil, and a selection of the uh, Architecture Go Global participants. Um, downstairs you'll be hearing presentations from uh, Raul Framstad Arkitekter and Helen and Hard. Um, that will be in Norwegian and up here is uh, Carmela and Jack and um, uh, Rodeo Arkitekter and Arlab. Um, and uh, up here the discussion will be uh, in English. Um, if you don't know where to go, then I suggest that uh, you guys stay up here and you guys come downstairs with me, uh, just to um, make up your mind for you. Um, uh, we'll start the discussion panels at uh, five, five after half, 14.35, and we'll meet back here at 15.20. So we're a little bit uh, shifting around the program. Okay?
Ok, folkens, da begynner vi igjen. We're starting again. Uh, do we have any of our uh, foreign guests left? No. In which case we can speak Norwegian. We can try. <laughs> Um, uh, som dere, fordi Jack, du skjønner jo alle nordiske språk, ikke sant? Da tar vi, da tar vi, det, på, tar vi det på norsk. Um, som dere skjønner, så er siste punkt på programmet, The End and Final Drinks, uh, forskyves med 15 minutter. Uh, mens, uh, og da blir det jo... Uh, anledning til å, uh, til å snakke enda mer både sammen og med de uh, inviterte ekspertene. Hva er best for uh, skri uh, screamingen, holdt jeg på å si, for streamingen? Er det med eller uten sånn bakgrunn? Uten at vi skruer på lyset. Ja, da gjør vi det. For da trenger vi ikke den. Voilà. Nydelig. Um, det er jo veldig naturlig i en uh, uh, diskusjon om internasjonalisering av norsk arkitektur å ha med Snøeta. Og vi er veldig glad for at uh, Kjetil Tredal Torsen, founding partner som dere vet i Snøeta, har uh, tid til å komme her og være en del av oppsummeringen og de avsluttende kommentarene på dagens uh, diskusjon. Snøheta har jo jobbet ute i verden egentlig helt fra begynnelsen en gang på 80-tallet, og nå har de 240 ansatte, står det på hjemmesiden deres, fra 23 ulike nasjoner, og kontorer i Oslo, New York, Innsbruck, San Francisco, Hong Kong, Adelaide og Paris. Um, velkommen. Takk. Kjetil. Det som vi har snakket litt om, jeg vet ikke hvor langt dere kommer i diskusjonen her oppe, men en ting som vi snakket litt om nede var tilfeldigheter versus planlegging. Altså, går det an å planlegge seg ut i verden? Kan man, står det til troende så at man kan ha en strategi som funker? Eller handler det om å være åpen for tilfeldighetene og ha en organisasjon som er i stand til å respondere? Og det er ikke lov å si begge deler. Nei, jeg skjønte det. Og det var det jeg hadde tenkt å si. <laughs> Hvis du måtte velge, hva er viktigst? Nei, altså, jeg tror det å gjøre um, er det viktigste. Hvis, hvis en skulle liksom, vurdere betydningen av strategisk tenkning, så er det omsetningen av strategi som er viktig, og ikke strategien i seg selv. Mm, og det tror jeg en må være ganske tydelig på, at um, det å gjøre uh, har en eksempelvirkning som er tydeligere og lettere å kommunisere enn selve strategien. Strategien er et internt... Uh, verktøy som vi jobber med innenfor egen organisasjon for å prøve å bevisstgjøre hva en eventuell satsing ute kunne bety, eller hvordan den ser ut. Så til syvende sist, hvis du skal velge det, så vil jeg sagt um, action. Mm. Og eh, dere har jo da jobbet ute helt fra begynnelsen. Eh, de siste årene når jeg har hørt Snøta presentere seg og sitt, så begynner det alltid med Alexandre. Mm. Gjorde det det? Ja, i bunn og grunn så vil jeg det si det. Det tok jo ti år for det prosjektet liksom satt seg fast i bakke. Ja, det gjorde det. Og det, det er jo normalt for noen av disse prosjektene. Det tar lang tid. Um, jeg tror det um, var flere ting uh, samtidig. Sant? Vi hadde jo prøvd litt sånn uh, forskjellige konkurranser i Norge og havnet på den der joka-plassen. Etter hvert så ble vi invitert som uh, klodden ja. inn i uh, konkurransene for å så på en måte bli av oppdragsgiver at en skulle tenke kreativt uh, for å komme forbi uh, på en måte etablerte ting som til syvende og sist da ble gjennomført alltid. Så da med beslutningen om å gjøre en annen type konkurranse ute som da falt på Alexandria mm. så var det logisk at vi hadde mye fokus når vi vant den, mye fokus på det. Det tok veldig lang tid, ikke sant? Det tok... Uh, bare kontraktsforhandlingene fra 1989 til 1993. Uh, og så oppstart med prosjekteringen 93, og så flyttet vi da 14 familier til Kairo, uh, med barn og leilighet og kontor. 
uh, og så var vi der i nästan to år uh, med den gängen. Og så var det byggestart i 95. og så uh, åpnet det vel i 2001. Uh, så, så det en lang reise, og vi tänkte jo på det tidspunkt når det åpnet, at, uh, eller rett før vi åpnet, at, uh, Når vi satt alt på en hest, det var veldig dumt. <laughs> ja, hvorfor det? Nei, Den kommer jo i mål, hesten. Ja, hesten kom i mål, men, men parallelt med det så hadde vi ikke noe fotfeste hjemme lenger. Vi hadde flyttet mesteparten av kontoret til Kairo. Hadde det veldig gøy, absolutt. Egen stasjonsvogn Pusho, som hentet alle om morgenen og innom bakeri og kaffeshop og før vi går på jobb. Ja, veldig hyggelig. Eh, flotte leiligheter, fine julefester. Det var eh, strålende tid. Men vi hade mistet fotfestet hjemme. Mm. Eh, så reetableringen av det, for så kom tilbake til Oslo på en måte, og prøve å reetablere seg i Oslo, viste sig faktisk å være tyngre enn å etablere seg i Kairo. <laughs> eh, Borte bra, men hjemme best, var det noen som sa på en tidligere... Ja. Nei, altså for oss var det omvendt. Ja. Så reetableringen i Oslo når vi kom tilbake var på en måte å gå inn i et nytt marked, hvor, hvor man var kjent for det kontoret som holdt på ute. Mm. Mens hjemmemarkedet egentlig ikke var det. Så vi, vi har slitt mer med å få innpass i Norden og i Norge enn ute. En slags omvendt internasjonalisering? Ja. En, en, en nasjonalisering, kan man ja. si. Ja. <laughs> uh, så i realiteten så føler jeg at vi er ikke noe godt eksempel mm. på hva en egentlig bør gjøre og hvordan en bør gjøre det. Uh, men samtidig så er jo... Uh, ok, så dere var ute, men dere var i Kairo. Det ble jo ikke noe mer i Egypt. Det var jo ikke det som da ble deres base. Nej, og det var jo fordi vi... Så det var jo hjemløse, egentlig? Vi var hjemløse, ja. Vi var litt veldig sånn på farten. Og, og det var litt igjen fordi vi sa vi hadde det som strategi, og det hadde vi egentlig planlagt. Det skulle være de første ti årene. En type hit and run strategi. Altså du gikk inn og trakk deg ut. Gikk inn og trakk deg ut. Og det var sikkert riktig for de ti første årene. Men det ville jo ha vært katastrofalt med dagens CO2-fotavtrykk i flyvning. Uh, og gjøre det, og ikke etablere ute der hvor du hadde aktiviteten. Mm. Sånn at til syvende og sist så var det ikke før i 2005, egentlig, at vi bestemte oss for å prøve å bli mer langvarig til stede der hvor vi hadde aktivitet. Ja. Og det var en beslutning. For det har vi diskutert med flere her, altså skal skal ikke i forhold til å etablere permanent tilstedeværelse da, for å si det sånn, ikke kalle det bransjekontor eller permanent tilstedeværelse på en eller annen måte, ja. ute, ja. utrolig krevende. Men det var, så dere på som en nødvendighet? Ja, etter hvert så ble det en nødvendighet, fordi mm. enten så måtte en fortsette hit and run strategien, eller så måtte en se på det nettverket en hadde bygd opp der hvor en var, og hadde gjort ett prosjekt og så se om det hadde mulighet i seg til å bli noe mer. Mm. Og da måtte, en, måtte vi som organisasjon og prøve å holde fast på noen av de grunnverdiene som lå i det som jeg har holdt på med, og på den måten klare å vise noen om at det var noe de trengte, eller vente på at noen kom og spurte det har vi lyst på, altså kom og levere det. Ja. Men, de, men det fungerte tydeligvis da, eller har dere liksom prøvd dere frem nei, nei. noen år der, noen år der, noen år der? Nei, det har vi ikke gjort. Altså de kontorene vi etablerer, det eneste som vi ikke fikk til å gå, det var Singapore. Ja. Men ellers så har vi jo valgt veldig forskjellige typer retning. New York er jo en mm. retning. San Francisco ble etablert på basis av SF MoMA-prosjektet. Men for eksempel i Innsbruck-kontoret, som Bjørk Ingelsen har random is that. Uh, det var jo... Uh, vi elsker jo etablering i disse stedene som, hvor ingen andre er. Ikke sant? Uh, for min Hvorfor del. Hvorfor kanskje noen østerrikske arkitekter i den tur? Ja, absolutt. De, men i stedet for å gjøre det i Wien, for eksempel. Ja. Eller etableringen i Australien, i Adelaide. Ikke i Melbourne, ikke i Sydney. Mm. Så den der uh, egen arten da, som vi snakker så mye om, ikke sant? Den manifesteres jo veldig mye gjennom hvordan du velger sted. 
Om du velger en liten fishpond, så blir du big fish. If you choose a big fishpond, you become a small fish. Så det er noe med hvordan du velger lokasjon, hvilke typer kontor du egentlig ønsker å gå for. Mens i Paris så var det jo basert på et visst antall prosjekt. Ja, for det er knyttet til konkrete prosjekter. Det er ikke bare... Det var det ikke i Adelaide og ikke i Innsbruck. Hva var grunnlaget? Hva var analysen? Var det noe analyse? Nei, analysen. Nei, må du gi det. Det er ikke bare å ha litt ekstra penger en søndag morgen. Nei, jeg hadde ikke penger heller, vet du. Det var verst av alt. Det har vi fortsatt ikke. Folk da? Ja, vi hadde folk. Du kjente noen derfra? Ja, vi hadde jo Patrick som hadde vært syv år i Oslo. Som jeg hentet med meg tilbake fra Innsbruck. For jeg var jo professor der i noen år. Og da var det jo sånn at noen ganger er det folk. Noen ganger er det prosjekter, noen ganger er det bare fordi du har lyst. Og så må du finne noen som også har lyst samtidig til det samme. Og plutselig så får du flere gode kretter som trekker samtidig i samme retning. Og da er det mulig å få til en god del ting, men ikke alt. Det er... Vi snakket litt i den første delen av dagen etter Carmelas innlegg om... Hun oppfordret jo til å ikke være redd. Jeg må være litt redd også. Altså, et snev av redsel synes jeg ikke er dårlig å ha med seg. Fordi at du skal jo trø ut forsiktig, og du skal jo være observant, og du skal liksom ut i terrenget når du står på ski. Du er jo ikke redd, men du er forsiktig i hvert fall. Men du må jo ta, noe risk er det jo i dette her. Hvis du ikke har penger, men har folk, det holder jo ikke. Nei, og det gjør det for så vidt ikke, så du tar jo alltid en risiko. Ja. Og risikoen er kjempesvær, men som jeg nevnte tidligere her, så har vi etter hvert funnet ut at den største risikoen er på en måte det regulative, politiske, nesten over alt der vi kommer. Så alle de andre risikene er relativt sett veldig mye mindre enn for eksempel politisk risiko et sted. Og det betyr jo da at hvis den er under 50 prosent, ja, så spiller det ingen rolle. Så det har vi gjort konsekvent de siste årene. Ja, analysere politisk og byråkratisk, for å kalle det det, risiko på de stedene som dere har valgt dere. Fordi de andre tingene som man på en måte kanskje har lettere for å fokusere på, er tross alt mindre risiko. Det er vesentlig mindre, og det betyr jo til syne og sist at i beslutningen du da tar, for å eventuelt greie det neste skrittet, så må du være villig til å ta den risikoen da, som er særlig den byråkratiske, regulative og politiske. Det snakket vi litt om nede, faktisk, dette med hva har man som nordisk arkitekt, eller nordisk organisasjon, de fleste bedrifter er jo å regne som en organisasjon, hva har man for fortrinn? Og en ting er det kulturelle, det kan vi jo godt snakke om, men også at vi er vant til, altså et ikke-hierarkisk samfunn med ganske likestilte deltakere, gjør at man kan jobbe ganske effektivt. Men så kommer man jo selvfølgelig med den forventningen om en byråkratisk effektivitet opp imot noen ganske hierarkiske strukturer og tunge byråkratier som man kanskje ikke har så mye krefter til eller anledning til å påvirke. Men har dere opplevd noe der? At dere har mulighet for å effektivisere de tunge sakene? Ja, altså det å være litt gjest samtidig som du er litt til stede eller litt lokal, åpner for et større toleransebegrep lokalt. Også i byråkratiet? Også i de som sier, ja, men sånn gjør vi det her, skjønner du? Ja, så derfor har jeg bevisst ikke lært meg fransk. Fordi det er veldig mye enklere å få ting oversatt, og jeg føler jeg får vesentlig større overbær. Ja, du blir ikke oversett da, og ignorert. Nei, langt ifra. For samtidig er det jo... En del ting som en ønsker å få tak i, ikke sant? Og derfor har jeg vært litt sånn opptatt av begrepet arkitektureksport. Jeg er ikke så glad i det begrepet, for å være helt ærlig. Fordi jeg mener at det er mer exchange enn det er eksport. Og det vil jo bety også at i det øyeblikket en går inn og stiller seg åpen for hugg, så får du også folk som hjelper deg på en annen måte. Og det gjelder også i byråkratiet, ikke sant? Så når... Når jeg hadde med Anne Hidalgo på byggeplassen til Le Monde i forrige uke, så snakker jeg ikke om arkitekturen i det hele tatt. Vi snakker om hva han gjør. 
Vad gör den för Paris? Vad gör den för befolkningen? Vad gör den för ansatte? Vad gör den för uh, uh, lokala lokala miljö? Vad gör bygge menar du? Ja, vad gör bygge? Vad gör arbetsplatsen för lokala miljö och för Paris? Och det är er väldigt mycket lättare och uh, på en måte bli guida in i ett system. Hvis du snakker om de tingene om hva, hva, hva arkitekturen egentlig gjør, mm. i stedet for å snakke om hvordan det ser ut. Ja. Og vi har lagt väldigt mye vekt på egentlig hva arkitekturen kan og skal gjøre, i stedet for å feste oss ved en slags um, stilretning eller en typ av arkitektur, men prøve å jobbe det kontekstuelt ut fra de oppgavene som er der. Og det er et samtaletema som flyter lett bara än att diskutera för exempel bara estetik. Det är er ju också en samtal som alla kan vara med på ja, uansett på var man är er än och vilka delar av processen ja. och samhället man befinner sig. Och då blir det statement från Pierre Berger som var ägare av Le Monde. Säger måndagen efter Charlie Hebdo uh, angreppen säger jag vill ha ett öppet tillgängligt mediehus mm. för publikum. Och så träffas beslutningen baserat på det utsagna och inte nöjaktigt på vad det ser ut. Ja. Og det, det er den type ting som egentlig gir gjennomslag på et helt annet nivå. For da regner en automatisk med at uh, når det kommer et norsk kontor, så får en også norske verdiene med på kjøpet. Ja, og der er vi med de uh, norske verdienes konkurransefortrinn ut, eller de forventningene som dere helt sikkert møtes med, ja. og som uh, uh, var en del, så vidt jeg forstår, av for eksempel etableringen i New York med ja. Ja. 9-11. Ja. Nei, fordelen er at ingen vet hva det er. Så du kan redefinere det hver gang. Uh, sånn at du kan bare forklare hva det er, og så blir det sant. Ja, de bare ønsker seg, hva da skal ni nevin og så ja, ja. får du lov å definere hva det er. Ja, for ingen vet hva det er. Uh, Men du vet det siden du er skandinav. Nej, vi vil oppfinne de for nytt hver gang, ikke sant? Så, uh, uh, Men handler det om prosess? Handler det, ja, det om den om måten du, du møter folk på, ja. lytter på? Du, du kan si det, det er en veldig enkel sammenkobling, for eksempel mellom uh, Ground Zero, uh, mm. definisjonen av det å komme fra Norge, og definisjonen av hvordan prosjektet gjennomføres. Så når vi da sier, basert på norske fredsforhandlinger der ute, sier at, uh, ok, dette prosjektet er et fremforhandleprosjekt, ikke et designerprosjekt. Mm. Vi vet det allerede, så hele prosessen er forhandlingsprosessen frem til et endelig objekt eller resultat, som er beskrivelsen av resultatet. Så driter vi litt i hvordan det kommer til å se ut, men det er måten som når du har republikaner, demokrater, katolikker, uh, muslimer, uh, uh, politifolk, brandfolk, alle er uenige. Ingen, ingen vil det samme. Og det vet du. Så sier du, ok, la oss sette oss ned og, og negotiate a project. Og da blir det kalt for negotiated architecture. Mm. Og da får det en egen typologi og en egen definition, som gjør at du kommer dig frem til slut, fordi du har allerede anerkjent kompleksiteten mm. i veien frem. Og basert på det, så kan du mest sannsynlig nå et resultat. Så uten den definitionen der, så hadde vi ikke kommet vei, uh, fremover, men hadde et nytt kontor foreslått det samme, mm. så hadde det ikke blitt trodd. Nej, ikke sant? Så med den uh, bakgrunnen som vi kom fra, så var det en troverdig, et troverdig forslag, mm på hvordan prosessen skulle håndteres. Og det er den vekten som du får med dig fra å komme fra Norge. Det er jo akkurat det vi snakket om med credibility, ikke sant? Troverdighet som vi allerede har, og som eh, man kan, bekrefter du jo da, ja. eh, benytte sig av. Men, men negotiated architecture, reducerer det arkitekturen til ren retorik? Ja, det gjør det. Og noen ganger er det riktig. Ikke sant? Arkitektur beveger seg mellom på en måte begrepsdefinitioner som samfunnet benytter sig av til enhver tid, og fysisk objekt. Så betydningen av uh, våre fysiske omgivelser vil gå hånd i hånd med hvordan vi definerer det, hvordan språket brukes. Og hvis vi definerer det på en bestemt måte, så kan vi kontrollere hvordan det oppfattes? Ja. Altså er det nok å si at noe er åpent, og så er det ingen som sjekker, liksom? Ja, det er en mulighet. Ja. Det er en mulighet, og den muligheten finnes. Samtidig så kan du ikke gjøre det alt for ofte, hvis det ikke funker. Nei. Så på et eller annet nivå så må du jo levere på de premissene som du hevder at du har. Så du, du må jo være tett opp imot det du til enhver tid hevder. Men veldig ofte sånn at det tanken og definisjonene løper litt foran arkitekturen. Du, du har en diskussion her som prøver å definere noe som du kanskje skal gjøre fremover i tid. Og så må du på en måte ha en forståelse av hvor du ønsker å gå før du egentlig kan gjennomføre det. 
Da forviller ofte veldig store deler av arkitekturen, og det er en del av kritikken i pressen også, vi har et sånt internt stammespråk, for eksempel, og alt det tullet der. Sånn at en jobber mer i retning av å prøve å definere nye ting, og så følge designprosessene og håndteringen av arkitekturen etter både kritisk tenkning, gjennomføringstenkning, håndtering, grunnlaget for hvorfor du gjør det du gjør. Den følger etter definisjonen. Fortellingen går foran. Fortellingen går foran, ja. Det er veldig, veldig interessant. Fortellinger er jo kjempebillig. Ja, de koster ingenting. Koster ingenting. Nei. Men det krever litt, da. Ja, og så krever det mye etter hvert. For du kan ikke gjenta den fortellingen kontinuerlig og så ikke levere. Nei, og du kan ikke gjenta den heller nødvendigvis fra sted til sted. Nei. Så fordi den fortellingen er jo deres, så den har du jo allerede solgt til noen andre. Riktig. Så på en måte hvordan disse tingene faller sammen underveis etter hvert, er jo også en del av spredningen faglig. Så hvis design, eller grafiske designavdelingen hos oss, på en måte har muligheten til å komme inn med den vinklingen, så har produktdesign den vinklingen, så har landskapsarkitektur den, og så har interiør den, og så har arkitekten den, og så urbanismen den. Så plutselig så får du muligheten til å dreie og vende på den der sirklen av ting, innenfor hvordan du eventuelt vekter det i det øyeblikk du står i samtalen. Så det vi har holdt på med også nå, i forbindelse med planleggingen av neste tredje årene, er jo en slags postrasjonalisering av hva vi har gjort. Så jeg er jo veldig opptatt av at postrasjonalisering er en av de viktigste tingene du kan lære av. Fordi alle sier, oi, det tenkte du på etterpå, men det gjorde alle valgt også. Han sa det med bølgen, det tenkte jeg på etterpå. Men postrasjonalisering er en ekstremt viktig prosess for å greie å skjønne egne interne tankeprosesser og systemutvikling internt. Så det bør den gjøre kontinuerlig, egentlig. Gjør dere det? Ja, nå gjør vi det. Men er det ellers en del av den bevisste operasjonen på kontoret? Ja, nå begynner det å bli det. Vi hadde jo, som vi sa, første ti årene, kan vi si. Kanskje til og med tolv, tretten. Hit and run, never look back. Ingen analyser, ingen erfaringstall, ingenting, ingenting, absolutt ingenting. Helt uforpliktende? Fullstendig uforpliktende, bare kjør. Bare en vei. Og så så vi at det i utgangspunktet var for mye arbeid relatert til nytenkning og formidling internt fra en viss størrelse av. Det kan du gjøre med 30 mennesker, kan du gjøre det. For da har du tacit knowledge distribution, ikke sant? Du har den stille kunnskapen som bare flyter i rommet, som du ser, som du følger med på, du trenger ikke forklare det på noen som helst måte. Mens hvis du går over de 30, så begynner du å bli avhengig av intern informasjon. Og da må du samtidig undersøke noe annet. For der vil det være mange som ikke har vært delaktige i en prosess. Og de må da inn i den prosessen på en annen måte enn de som satt faktisk og tegnte på prosjektet eller var involvert. Hvordan holder dere kontakt mellom de ulike kontorene deres ute i verden? Det er flere nivå. Det er mye personalutveksling fram og tilbake. Ikke veldig mange hver gang. Det kan være en eller to som flytter dit, dit, dit fra hjemmekontoret, blir i perioder på ett til to år, maks to år. Og så har vi jo disse felles tingene våre, Dovre Conversations, som er kjempeviktig, som er fire dager i året. Enten her eller ute, hvor alle samles, hvor vi egentlig prøver å meisle ut en del av de ting vi skal gjøre, i hvert fall neste året, på utveksling. Så Dovre Conversations og turen opp til Snøretta er ekstremt viktig her for samling i bunnen, da, kan man si. Du må bare forklare for folk hva Dovre Conversations er, for de som ikke vet det. Ja, Dovre Conversations er å samle kontoret på Dovre, fra hele verden. Og så en av de fire dagene er å gå opp til snøheta og ned igjen. Det er en sånn pilgrimstur som alle må gjøre. Så det er en fantastisk opplevelse, faktisk, fordi den er jo utfordrende for mange. Selve turen, ja. Selve turen, ja. Så da er alle såpass dødslitende etterpå, at alle åpner seg helt og forteller nøyaktig hvordan de har det. Og de er på en måte... Tverkulturelt. Tverkulturelt, ja, ikke sant? Da har du 
folk från Nyak som inte har varit i natur som är er högre än en rennesteinshöjd, ikvant, och som plötsligt har varit på snöheta och de är er stolta och det är er fantastiskt. Mm. Och de går och de tänker samtidigt och de snackar i grupper och så plötsligt så har vi lagt bunden för de två andra dagarna med samtal. Och så plejer det dukka upp där fällesprojekt i löp av den perioden och så samlas de in i en slags handlingsplan kan du säga. Si. Utan att vi är er så nöje på handlingsplanen. Men... <laughs> Ikke nöje på handlingsplan? Nej, för det all planläggning är er ju vi som planlägger på så måte att det inte innebär en viss flexibilitet i den planläggningen så bommen. Ja. Och det betyder att det, det handlingsplanen är er slags rammeverk den och så handlingsplanen beveger sig mer i riktning av strategisk tänkning än faktiskt ja. men så finns det en del ting som du må hugga av då på teknologi för exempel eller mm. det jag er upptatt av det där med kultur för att det, det du det du beskriver i förhåll till uppdragsgivare ute för exempel betydningen av språket retoriken man skulle kunna tro då att den kulturbyggingen som det gör på kontoret kunde man göra i ett seminarrum men då är er det plötsligt ute och upplever ting fysisk sammen. gör det det med uppdragsgivare också ja ja det, vi hade en väldigt 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 morsom historia vi hade första uppdragsgivaren i Dubai så hade vi lejt en sån västlands skärk som du skulle segla vi skulle segla sammen med, med han du var två stycken med familje och barn och full pakke. De var på besök i Norge. De var på besök i Norge. Leide vi den där segelskärken då. Och den hade hängeköjor och måste pissa över räcka och det. Och dessa gutta vet som kom från Dubai, de hade ju aldrig lagat en middag eller vaska upp en tallerken, ikring sant? Så det måste de ha ombord. Eh och plötsligt så var det sånt att det, det var inte möjligt för dig att förlata den upplevelsen upplevde som var satt i bunn så starkt att om de hade villat gå till en annan arkitekt så hade de inte klart det för det för det upplevelsen satt så stark i det och inte nog med det men nu ena dattern vet du blev dödsfrälska i han ena skipsskutten uh, så de, de satt som höna på en vagle långt upp i mastar ikring sant och flörtade så vilt uh, Nej men men alltså det också både i, I, I Asien, alltså i Kina, Thailand, Korea, Japan och uh, bruke lång tid tidlig. Mm. Hälsa på familjen, värna ut på karaokebar. Uh, liksom gör de tingen som du gör för du i det hela tatt går in och börjar snacka om ja, ska det bli ett projekt, ska det inte bli ett projekt, liksom mm. extremt tålmodighet säger vi. Vi är er ju vant med att gå rätt på sak. Ja, det ja, ligger också lite i den norska förretningskulturen. Ja, välkommen hit och vad kan vi göra för dig? Ja. Ja, det må du ikke begynne med, vet du. Det... Gjør dere kulturelt analysearbeid før dere går løs på noe, eller spiller du det liksom, tar du det som det kommer? Du er jo avhengig av sosiale egenskaper også, da, hos de som jobber på kontoret, for eksempel. Ja, absolut. Vi har ingen spesifikke analyser. Vi har koblet til oss antropologer i perioder, mm. men ikke alltid. Litt avhengig av hvordan, hvor, hvor vanskelig vi opplever oppgavene der. For dere holder dere på kontoret, holder dere jo til designfagene. Mm. Dere har ikke, ja, da, ikke antropologer selv. og sosiologer. Og Nei, men vi henter de inn når, når vi ja. må. Ikke sant? Så de, vi er ansett ingen, men, men de er i den der Saturn-ringen mm. rundt oss. Og det kan være forfatter, eller musiker, eller kunstnere, eller hvem som helst. Men, mm. men, men i realiteten så handler det mer om tålmodighet, har jeg hørt det noen som sa det, om å lytte, mm. sitte stille i salen. Mm. <laughs> sitte stille i salen i en periode, og bare um, og så prøve å ta det du har hørt og prøve å faktisk skjønne det mm. altså ikke bare jump to conclusions, men prøve, prøve å skjønne innholdet i det som faktisk er blitt formidlet da. det du snakker om når du snakker om skjarken mm. eh, som på en måte blir en del av det mm. dere tilbyr så handler det jo om å uh, lite det som uh, Nille sa, altså don't bullshit yourself, uh, og ikke andre heller. Nei. Du kan ikke gå in i det hvis du ikke går in i det med hele din livserfaring. Nei. På en måte, du må mene alvor. Du må mene alvor. Uh, og det høres helt uh, absurd ut at det skal være så speciellt. Mm. Men det betyder jo at det er bare jævlig mange som ikke har den dimensionen med sig ja, i det hele tatt, men, men som det, ja. selger en eller annen slags uh, prepackaged 
Ja, men det kommer an på hva du velger, ikke sant? Vi snakker om det her oppkjøpsboomen som finnes nå, på verdensbasis, hvor du og massevis av store selskaper konsoliderer seg i form av oppkjøp av arkitektkontorer rundt omkring. Relativt store kontorer. Svære summer som er i omløp. Hvis du vil velge en corporate modell, så må du ha en helt annen strategi. Da må du rulle inn i markedet, rulle ut det beste av teknologi, beste av mennesker, best betalte stillingene. Da må du ha en superfinansiering i bunn, for det er det helt tatt å forholde til. Men hvis du ruller ut mer på studiobasis, egenart, forståelsen av det du gjør, så trenger du ikke så mye penger, og du behøver ikke bli oppfattet corporate. Og det er derfor vår etableringer ute heter studio. Snøpa Studio, Innsbruck, Snøpa Studio, Adelaide. Fordi de er studio. De drives av mennesker som kjenner hverandre ekstremt godt, jobber med de tingene de gjør, og er det som de tilbyr markedet, og derfor kommer mange av de lokale arkitektene og ber om samarbeid. Vi har jo sammenheng med at de reiste og besøkte alle australske kontorer som kunne tenke seg å være konkurrenter, og sa, nå kommer vi til Australia. Vi kommer ikke for å ta jobbene deres, men vi kommer for å samarbeide. Og da fikk vi plutselig fem jobber. Men ikke fulle jobber, men i samarbeid med dem. Ja, et sted må man jo begynne. Tålmodighet, ser du, koster tålmodighet penger? Er det en investering for kontorene? Vi har jo en bransjestruktur i Norge med i hovedsak små og mellomstore bedrifter i arkitektbransjen. Ja, alle har tid. Ikke sant? Og veldig få har en inntjening som gjør det mulig å legge seg opp investeringskapital, for eksempel til en til en internasjonal satsning. Men, så derfor er jeg litt ute etter, er det andre måter å tenke på som gjør det mulig? Som gjør det mulig i hvert fall å prøve, i hvert fall å være med her og der, i hvert fall å forsøke seg, uten at man liksom føler at man må ha millioner på baken? Jeg kan si, med Alexandra da, så hadde vi kanskje minus 20 prosent. Ja, akkurat. Så det koster jo lang tid. Så den tålmodigheten mener jeg også, den har sammenheng med økonomi, men i en vanlig forståelse av en kapitalistisk forretningsorden, så vil det alltid være sånn at en tror at en må ha mye penger, fordi tid er penger, ikke sant? Mens tid egentlig er noe som kommer, ikke noe som har gått. Og det betyr jo da i realiteten at du må vri på innsatsen din, du må definere den annerledes. Du må se på verdien av det som skal bli gjort, ikke det som er blitt gjort. Og det betyr da, etter min oppfatning, at det er det vi kaller for singular and the plural, altså individene som selskapsstrukturen består av, er de som bidrar til fellesskapet og ikke omvendt. Så hvis du la en selskapsstruktur som en tung dyne over alle som jobber, så vil du ikke få det egen initiativet som trengs. Og da må du også akseptere en viss grad av autonom handling, som gjør at friheten... I organisasjonen, tenker du? I organisasjonen, ja. Som gjør at de forskjellige interessene får lov til å blomstre. Og da... Når du med visse jevne mellomrom, så må du bare påse at det ikke er for langt ut av forbi cylinderen, ikke sant? Og så bare hanke inn litt her og litt der. Men det fører jo til et voldsomt engasjement. Fordi nå er det en gang sånn at mye av denne bransjen fortsatt er livsstilsvalg. Og det betyr jo i realiteten at du får aldri råd til en jott, for å si det sånn. Ja, det var den sjarken da. Den var bare leid da, og den var gammel. Jo, men en leid gammel sjark, den hadde jo tydeligvis en viss effekt. Jeg tror ikke det hadde hatt samme effekt om jeg hadde en svær hvit jott og invitert i samme på den. Det har de jo mye større selv. Har du så liten jott? Men det er så mye av de forventningene i forhold til det å jobbe internasjonalt som på en måte sitter mellom ørene på oss. Det tror jeg da. Bevisst og ubevisst, ikke sant? Vi lærer jo ikke noe om hvordan dette skal gjøres, egentlig, som en del av utdanningen vår. Altså, rådet mitt til de som har kommet innom noen ganger og spurt hos oss, det har jo vært å se på det du gjør, se på det du selger, sammenligne det med det som er gjennomsnitt ute. Er du bedre? Go for it. Hvis du har følelsen av at din egen organisasjon faktisk har noe å bidra med, 
Du må prøve det. Mm. Og da er det veldig ofte offentlige eller private konkurranser der ute. Og vi ser at gjennomsnittet av norsk arkitektur, for eksempel, er vesentlig bedre enn gjennomsnittet internasjonalt. Vesentlig bedre. Mm. Så det er ingen grund til at den ikke på en måte kunne tenke seg at det hadde gjennomslag, men da må en gjøre det på en annen måte enn corporate business. Mm. Uh, arkitektur som sådan har jo en egen definition. Det er ikke kunst, sant? det er arkitektur. Det er likeverdig, men arkitekturen har jo en annen definition. Og det er også vært tydelig uh, på en måte innenfor fagdisciplinen på hva en faktisk bærer med seg. Både kunnskap, utdanning, uh, sosiale modeller, forståelsen av uh, hvem du slåss med, så, og mot, til enhver tid, så kan den bringe det inn i diskusjonen, og på den måten klare å geleide diskusjonen i riktig retning i forhold til riktig resultat. Og da er historiene uh, en del av det. Mm. Ja, og det å komme seg i posisjon til å fortelle de historiene, for at, bare et siste spørsmål før vi, før vi avslutter, dette med konkurranser. Mm. Er det det som er døra inn? Der får du jo ikke anledning til å fortelle noen historier i det hele tatt. Nei, det er ikke riktig, fordi at akkurat nå så er største delen av konkurranser i verden eh, følger med eh, framleggelse av konkurransebidrag. Ja. Så det er veldig, veldig få konkurranser internasjonalt hvor du ikke samtidig presenterer. Så du skal pitche? Mm. Mm. Uh, så det lærer på en måte uh, assosiativ tenkning og projisere den ut er en av de aller viktigste tingene, tror jeg, og da må du bruke tid for å vite at du assosierer riktig. Mm. Lærer man det på skolen? Det aner jeg ikke. <laughs> Lærte du det på skolen? Nei, jeg tror ikke det. Jeg studerte jo i Østerrike, ikke sant? Og det, det var et gammeldags opplegg. Det var fra Maria Theresia sin tid. Så... <laughs> jeg tror vi skal avslutte. Jeg så det var noen spørsmål. Eh, spør dem... Eh, underveis eh, i eh, eh, av den aller siste final 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 avslutning av eh, arkitektur ut i verden som er eh, å dele et glass på slutten av dagen. Eh, jeg synes eh, at eh, det å se på det som kommer og ikke det som ligger bak og legge en verdi på det er en fantastisk innspill til en eh, forretningsplan for eh, arkitekter. Vi er eh, et, hva heter det for noe, et forslagstillende fag, propositional discipline. Absolutt. Det er det vi, vi lever av det som skal komme. Mm. Så tusen takk til Kjetil Tredal Torsen. Tusen ja, takk takk. til alle som har bidratt med sine innsikter her i dag. Tusen takk til Kulturdepartementet. Tusen takk til Innovasjon Norge for fantastisk bra samarbeid. Tusen takk til alle deltakebedriftene som har delt sine innsikter og alle andre som har eh, bidratt underveis. Takk for i dag. Takk for i dag.